Welcome to the Orange Water and Sewer Authority Board of Directors work session this Thursday, May 9th, 2019. Does any board member know of any conflict or potential conflict of interest with respect to any item on the agenda tonight? Okay, so Bob Epstein is on his way, so um, he'll be here shortly. Another announcement is uh, Robert Morgan and I will provide OWASA's annual update to the Carborough Board of Aldermen on Tuesday, June 4th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Carborough Town Hall, which will feature the Agua Vista web portal demo by Mary Tiger and Ed Curran will also be attending. And without objection, there's gonna be a change to the order of our agenda items. Item number five, um, resolution honoring the service of Willie A. Stroud to the Orange Water and Sewer Authority and the Carborough Chapel Hill community will move under the consent agenda because Mr. Stroud is not in attendance tonight. And our item number six, resolution authorizing the executive director to execute contracts with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina for employee health and dental service plans will be the first item on our regular agenda. Announcements by board members. John Young, you have one. Ed Kerwin and I uh, attended the Chatham Orange County's Joint Planning Task Force meeting today, as well as John Morris. Uh, uh, we'll distribute the minutes and presentation materials when they are available to us, but there were three topics. One was uh, Jordan Lake One Water Initiative, JLO for short. And uh, there's a presentation by Jen Schmitz, who's a uh, principal planner for the Triangle J Council of Governments. So uh, she kind of gave us an overview of what they're doing and pretty impressive, a collaboration of stakeholders across six counties. It looked like about six counties. I, I didn't actually count, but, uh, and they're focusing on water quality in all its forms, whether that's potable water or storm water, reclaimed water, wastewater, uh, that, that's the idea of one water. It's all uh, a valuable resource. And, um, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of politics around uh, upstream nutrient control for J Jordan Lake going into the, let's say, Greensboro area. And that is one of the topics, but they emphasize that that's just one topic. They're also focusing on, you know, resilient interconnectivity of the uh, water utilities and land conservation and research and so forth. It seems very well supported and funded. And uh, it's, it sounds like it's beginning to receive national attention as a model for regional collaboration. So that all sounds good. Second topic was storm, stormwater best management practices. And we heard from uh, the Orange County uh, stormwater officer, as well as the uh, one of the engineers and the stormwater administrator for Chatham Park. <coughs> Uh, and, you know, so they were just sharing best management practices for the other jurisdictions to learn from. I thought Chatham Park looks pretty promising. They have sort of a points-based assessment of all their innovative initiatives they're trying to deploy. And they, they kind of calibrated themselves as somewhere halfway between Pittsburgh's standards for wa uh, water quality management and a natural setting. So, which is, you know, about as good as it can get. So. I thought that was impressive. And every uh, stormwater management feature they're building, they, they're turning into to an amenity. So it seemed like a healthy approach there. And the last topic was uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan Employment and Population Projections for 2045. That was presented by the Orange County Planning Director. Uh, what I took away from that is a, a lot of raw data and sort of aggregation of data at this stage. I don't know that they've judged that data or made some actual forecasts. You, yet unless I misinterpreted what they were saying. Any other comments? Yep, all right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other board members that have an announcement? Okay, announcements by staff. Todd Taylor, Robert? Yes, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce you all to uh, Jesse Duclaw, who is our new um, distribution and collection systems manager um, taking the place of Randy Horton, who was here for 
a million and a half years. <laughs> but anyway, Jesse, uh, Jesse comes to us from Moffett Pike, which may be a familiar name to you all. They've done a lot of work for us on um, sewer, water and sewer pipeline projects in the area and uh, definitely have helped us out in a lot of situations, including the emergency we have going on right now and have been a, a go-to contractor for, for many years for us. And Jesse was a big part of that. He was a project manager there, managed multiple projects in the area, uh, was over a number of crews, and, and he's a Orange County resident, and he's also the assistant chief at the uh, Orange Grove Volunteer Fire Company. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Jesse uh, just say hi. Hi. <laughs> um, excited to be here. Look forward to working with everyone. Uh, a lot of information coming in so far. So good. It's a great group of people and looking forward to the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments, suggestions, or information items by board members? Okay. So on our consent agenda, we have four items. First is the fiscal year 2019 budget amendment. Second is our minutes of the March 28, 2019 meeting of the board of directors. Our third item is our minutes of the April 25th, 2019 closed session of the board of directors for the purposes of updating the board regarding the settlement of existing litigation and our Fourth is a resolution honoring the services of Willie A. Stroud to the Orange Water and Sewer Authority and the Chapel Hill community. Are there any public comments on our consent agenda? Does any board member want to pull an item from the consent agenda or have any questions or comments? Um, Rashir? Yeah, I, I just felt a little confused about agenda item one. So I guess. Yes. <laughs> Stephen. Hi, uh, Stephen Winters, Director of Finance and Customer Service. Yes, sir. Um, so I, I just trying to make sure I understood the the reason for the amendment, and I, and I think I did. But um, then the question about the I think it may have been Ray that had the question um, about um, the Rogerson pump stuff and. I don't know. Basically, I just want to make sure or get a clarification on the 2019 budget amendment, um, and if that has any bearing on what's going on now. At the Rogerson Drive, right? No, the the budget amendment is due to be an under under budget on revenue, water revenue, uh, spending some money on hurricane that we didn't plan for, and things like that. The Money that we're spending on Rogerson Drive is actually going to end up being a, um, a CI or is a CIP project, so it's not in the operating budget. It'll end up being an asset. It's you know it's going to be a lot um, of money, so that, that's not going to run through the operating budget. Not even the emergency part. No, <coughs> I'll, I'll be part of the asset we end up with. Okay. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Any additional questions? Okay, so can I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? Second. Okay, so motion made by Bob Morgan, second by... Okay, <laughs> Rushi Abora. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you. So now we're moving on to our regular agenda. Um, item number six, resolution authorizing the executive director to execute contracts with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina for employee health and dental insurance plans. We have Stephanie Dat Glasgow. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. So last month uh, was the last time we talked about this item, the employee health and dental insurance renewal. Uh, both those contracts expire on, I'm sorry, expire on June 30th, 2019. And as you recall, um, the board gave us feedback and told us to continue to negotiate with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and not to market the plans. Um, our broker, Hill Cheston and Woody, a Gallagher company, uh, in your packet had provided a letter of recommendation saying that we uh, renew the health plan with a decrease in premiums of 18% uh, 
and a 10% increase in premiums for the dental plan. Um, your packet also includes um, Ellen's uh, presentation that you're going to receive tonight. I do stand by to answer any questions that you have. And with that, I present Ellen Tucker with Hill, Chesson and Woody. Sorry, I'm moving a little bit slow these days. Okay. Now, I have a herniated disc, so there we go. Um, good evening, everyone. Good to see you again. Good to see you. We missed you last time. Um, there it is. I couldn't find the clicker. Okay, so tonight we're going to go over the revised medical renewal. Um, we updated all the plan designs that we considered last time, and then we have the dental renewal, which is now negotiated. We'll talk about that, and then uh, next step. <clears throat> So we originally started at negative 5.8. When we spoke with you last time, we were at negative uh, 15, and now we're at negative 18. So there's nothing left, okay? So <laughs> uh, we're not gonna get any more off the renewal than that. So um, we're showing what the total premium cost is, as well as the cost to Owasa. We did have an issue uh, in one of the numbers last month, so that's been updated. So these are all the correct numbers now. So that will show you what the change to current is um, for both the budget perspective and in the total premium. We updated the plan design option, so you'll see current plan at the negative 18, and then all the different options we looked at um, range from negative 19.5 to negative 26.8. So um, would you like to talk through any of those? Yes. I, I'm, I missed the last meeting, as you, you did. noted, and I, I had sent an email out, and I'm just curious if <clears throat> someone could quickly s summarize the discussion about looking at any of the options. Was there any interest in doing that, or um, was there some discussion decided, no, that's not the way we want to go? I know we had removed one of the options, which was a formulary. We, didn't, we weren't interested in that one, so that one is gone. Um, the other ones were just, just to keep, just to see what it would look like. Okay, so I, I think that says there wasn't a whole lot of discussion. And I think I, I'd like to put it on the table if there's other people interested in looking at some of these options. And we can go into that later or now if that makes sense. So what we looked at was changes to the offices at co-payments to urgent care emergency room. Um, to the deductible and a couple of the choices, and then there were adjustments to the out-of-pocket max. So all of these leave the pharmacy copays the way they are currently. Um, Blue Cross has pack packaged plans, so when you change one thing, it makes other decisions for you. So we were just going through um, some of the options that gave additional savings, and sometimes that meant one change, sometimes it means two or three changes. So uh, first of all, I appreciate all the options laid out. That's that's very helpful. And of course, I'm excited about the, the reductions we've been able to achieve, achieve under whatever scenario. Um, we don't have the competitive data in this uh, packet, but it was in that one from a month ago. Correct. And uh, my recollection of that is that um, we're one of the few, if may, perhaps the only, that has uh, 100% coinsurance, or I think that means 0% coinsurance, right? Um, Correct. So there are two out of the five that we looked at that have 100%. Yeah, the combination of that and the really the low out-of-pocket maximum. So for us, 1750 and 3500, that combination is what seemed unique relative to some of the competitors and the industry. And, and I'm not trying to nickel and dime this. It's, it, this is a major expense. And we, we've done, uh, we've looked at a lot of uh, other elements of compensation that we have adjusted upward. And, and I've proudly supported that, you know. So I just want to make sure that if we're, we're looking at calibrating with market and doing the right thing, that we do that consistently across all of our major benefits. So that, that's why I raise this one. So if we look at the out-of-pocket max of the five, um, including Owasa, you're in the middle. You're exactly the middle one on out-of-pocket max. Again, to me, it's the con well, maybe I should pull it up and, and just pause, but it was, what I recall was the combination of those two. We yeah. were the lowest of those who had 0% coinsurance. Because um, Town of Chapel Hills is kind of a fake 
out of pocket max. Um, mathematically, you couldn't hit it. That was put in place back when um, plans had to count copays toward the out of pocket max. Before it was only deductible and co insurance and copays you paid forever. And since they have a custom plan design, they were able to set that at whatever number they wanted. So they just chose one to not make their plan even richer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so no one hits that. That's not a number that's ever that ever comes into play. Do you have that that comparison with? I have it in front of me. I don't have it in that presentation unless someone can get to last time. So, for example, Town of Chapel Hills deductible is two hundred and fifty dollars, and then it's covered at one hundred percent. So it it would you couldn't get to three thousand. That makes sense. I see. It wasn't on the 25th April. When was that? It was April 11th? Mm No, it's not on April 11th. It was. Oh, it was sent separately. It was sent by email, wasn't it? Oh. The agenda packet didn't have it. It was sent by email. I think Stephanie sent that. I'm sorry if this is not a feeling way to spend the board's time. I mean, let's move on, but okay. Well, we do we when do we have to decide the plan option? The next meeting at the latest. That would be the latest date, yes. That should be page five, Put two more. Oh, I can do it? Awesome. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, we're on the right one. So we actually have the highest deductible of the five. Um, deductible drives the most cost, if you will, because it's first dollar, where coinsurance out of pocket max, those are kind of last dollar, if that makes sense. And you're saying that Chapel Hill out of pocket max is not really, a, I guess that only applies that they're going out of network or something like um, that? It's 3,000 in network. <coughs> Oh, um, it'll be well. Actually, it's three thousand out of network too. They have the same in and out again because they just chose that number. So if you paid two hundred and fifty dollars for a surgery and that's all you owed, it would take a lot of offices at copayments and pharmacy to be able to come up with three thousand dollars of cost. So it's not really something we would compare to. <clears throat> Can you describe? Uh, Co-insurance practices in the rest of, you know, outside sort of these government agencies. What's sort of the typical model these days? Um, it, it depends. Um, in your industry, we see richer, like ninety percent or one hundred percent. If it's manufacturing, you're going to see eighty percent standard. Mm -hmm. it, it, it depends a lot on the industry and location. Um, also depends somewhat on what the deductible level is too, so. What, what was coinsurance again? I know I asked this like two weeks, That's two fine. months ago, but. So <laughs> if you had a surgery, for example, you would pay your deductible and then you would pay a percentage of the remaining cost. 
if you had a okay, so ten thousand dollar cost, you would pay seven hundred fifty dollars, and then if you had eighty percent coinsurance, you pay twenty percent of the rest okay. of it. So we're basically saying use in network and it's covered after the deductible. Correct. And what is it out of network coinsurance? Um, probably seventy. I'd have to pull it up. So everything on out of network will be more expensive. It'll be a higher deductible coinsurance, higher out of pocket max. Yeah. You do. And as I said, that affects people more than the out of pocket max does because that's first dollar coverage on a surgery, an MRI, any kind of scan, um, that type of thing. That doesn't, that seems strange to me because when you go look at the options that you've played out, um, I mean, there's some real cost savings even with the same deductible and just changing the out of pocket or the coinsurance, right? Yeah, so um, anything you change will have an effect. It's if mm -hmm. you raise the deductible, you have more effect than adding coinsurance, if that makes sense. Because it's first dollar and it's you're paying 100% of the cost. Once you switch to coinsurance, you're paying 20% of the cost, for example. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to explain. Yeah. Apparently not, clearly. Okay, so this is a tough one to wrestle with. I, I'm, you know, what I'm sensing is not something that ever a lot, of, you know, a majority of board members really want to dig into. John, I think a, an issue that a number of us resonated with was the notion that uh, the employees did a great job of, of uh, containing um, costs and we feel, or I certainly feel uncomfortable hitting them uh, after they d they've done a good job. Uh, I would be m much more willing to address reducing coverage after we've had a high year or a high couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. What, what is the 25% thing again? The pharmacy copay? The pharmacy. So if you take a fifth tier, which are usually specialty drugs, um, you pay 25% of the cost, but it has to be between 50 and $100 per month. I think there was another point made that I remember that uh, changing any of these numbers, these are not percentages, so the, uh, the lower paid employees <coughs> get hit worse when, when you change any of these numbers, if you change them to save cost. And that was another point I, I, I remember that was brought up at one of those meetings. <laughs> and I don't really have a stomach for that. Did we ever get um, a, like how this would actually affect Owasa's budget, those five options or four options, whatever? Um, I mean, I can calculate out if you're looking at one, how much it is. Savings are like, I mean, some of these options are, let's say, seven, you know, I'd say five to seven or eight percent of our health insurance budget, which is it's two point million dollars. Yeah. yeah. So when you ask about savings, so it's approximately with an 18 percent decrease, it's approximately three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in savings. Um, that would be about 316000 for Awasa and 31000 for employees from where we currently are. So 
I hope that answers your question, Rashir. Oh, well, what I was thinking more is, does option one, how many, how many dollars would that save compared to the current plan, for example? Um, yes. No, it was a, I, I don't see it in the presentation, but. So, <laughs> that was the renewal. Hang on. Okay, so, um, table. Um, Go back to the yeah, you show that. Oh, yeah, it's a different file, but uh, yeah, yes, please. please. So if you're we're saving, we're cutting at eighteen percent. That's three hundred sixteen thousand. So uh, to me, the math works out that every five thousand is every five percent of it is worth about ninety thousand. So if you look at these options here, oh, okay, then it's really not much. Except for option two, three, and four. Does our um, medical option also affect the dental? I thought that was a package deal. Um, they're separate rates, so it doesn't affect the rate. I have to go to my car to get you good numbers that I'm Sorry. doing off the fly. <laughs> I can go get it and pull it up if you want to. Yeah. So right now, if you had a surgery, you would pay $750, and then the plan pays the rest. Right, okay. If you had a surgery and you had coinsurance, you'd pay $750, and then you would pay 20% of the remaining cost of the surgery. Okay. That's what that means. Same thing with an MRI or any other type of service that goes to deductible coinsurance. But then that would be capped by the maximum. Yeah, all of that would count towards your out-of-pocket net. Okay. You want me to go get the actual number? Yeah, Ed. And I'll just um, repeat staff's recommendation is not to change benefits, Bruce and and um, Ray would call to the three reasons. An another, a third reason is um, it is an extremely tight labor market, and um, and you know the health insurance we know from experience is always something a candidate looks at very carefully. Uh, and as you know, we've had great difficulty filling a number of jobs, particularly in, uh, in our engineering department. In fact. One of the few qualified candidates we're considering actually has a richer health insurance package out of state than what we offer. So, again, uh, I, Bruce and Ray recalled two important reasons, and again, the, another third one for our team is, you know, in such a competitive, tight labor market, you know, we, we don't think this is the year to to pull that one back. So. I just say thank you for taking time to consider it and evaluate it. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to drag it out anymore. So you want to continue on with the presentation okay. first? So dental renewal, um, we started at 15.6. We knew the dental plan wasn't running particularly well. The loss ratio was over 90%. 
So um, we negotiated anyway, but um, we got it down to 10%. Uh, we were not expecting to get it down probably below that. So that's where we are right now is a 10% increase on the dental coverage. There was, oh, sorry. I'll let you finish. Go ahead. No, ask your question. I, I remember seeing something about vision care. I didn't remember seeing that before. Or something about loss of vision care with Blue Cross Blue Shield. The Blue Cross yes. Blue Shield has taken vision care out of all of their policies. Yeah, so that's affecting all of the groups. Okay, so is there a plan to for that, or are we just dropping it? Or? OWASA already offers vision coverage separately to employees. Oh, okay. We have an in-house vision care reimbursement program. Okay. Thanks. If we're through discussion, I'd move that we adopt the resolution authorizing the executive director to execute the contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield for employee health and dental insurance. Okay, so can I get um, to see if there's any members of the public that wanted to make any questions? Okay. And so you've okay. made the motion, and so now we can get a second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you. So now we're moving on to um, update on the emergency repair of the Rogerson Drive wastewater force main and resolution finding emergency circumstances requiring purchase of materials and service without formal board um, bidding processes. We have Mary Dar. Good evening. PowerPoint comes up. I have two main objectives um, in my presentation tonight. Um, first is a status update. You'll recall Todd Taylor and I did a tag team presentation at your April 25th board meeting. Um, and this is an update to that. And then the second is the resolution um, that we're asking the board to adopt tonight for the uh, um, procurement of Contracting services exemption, <laughs> the word I was looking for. All right. So going back to one of the maps you'll recall from our April 25th presentation. Um, first, I want to talk about what we've accomplished since we were last in front of the board. So you'll recall orientation again to the map on the screen. To the north is the Rogerson Drive pump station that's near Cleland Drive and the Rainbow Soccer Fields. Um, to the south off of this map is our Mason Farm wastewater treatment plant. Um, between those two facilities, we have about 11,000 foot force main, um, a pressurized pipe that transfers about half of the wastewater in our community. Um, basically, you can think of it, if you're not in Carborough and you're not on UNC campus and you flush the toilet, it's probably going to end up going through this pipe. Um, campus and, and, and uh, Carborough pretty much come through um, different pipes to get to the wastewater treatment plant. On the map, the orange line that's to the right is the bypass pipe that we were uh, installing, it already had installed on the 25th. The blue pipe is the pipe that we were still installing when Todd and I did the update. We were replacing the X marks the spot. That's where we had the leak on April 12th. Um, we were replacing about 520 feet of the existing 30 inch force main. And we completed that installation. We fully tested it like we do with any of our um, pipes that are installed. And we placed that in service on April the 30th. A couple photos um, from there. So this is Rogerson Drive. Raleigh Road or NC-54, whichever you prefer to call it, is to our back and we're looking north up Rogerson Drive towards the Rogerson Drive pump station. So this is um, what it looked like on April 29th, lots of uh, construction debris. On the right-hand side of the photo is that bypass, that um, HDPE, high density, high density polyethylene pipe that was installed um, and that was the state of the road on the 29th. 
since then, we've done a lot of um, work. Moffitt um, has done a lot of cleanup along Rogerson Drive. So, but we did and always had intended to leave the, the temporary force main on the side of the road, knowing that we still had a lot of uncertainty um, under where the pipe crosses under Raleigh Road. Um, note, we do still have to do um, final cleanup and um, resurfacing of Rogerson Drive, um, and we'll do that um, later as we uh, continue on with, with the construction process. All right, so what's happened since? So we put the pipe in service on April 30th. On the morning of May 1st, we discovered another leak um, basically at that southern connection point. We're very confident the connection point to the north, we had good quality pipe. Um, you'll recall from Todd Taylor's, when he was doing a video, we had a very distinct delineation of pipe materials. Backing up a little bit more about the force main. So that's, this pipe was put in four different construction contracts over in the early 90s to install this pipe. Um, it was a phased construction again for this two miles. Um, so it was one of those transitions where we had connected to good pipe. So we're confident of that northern connection, but we were always a bit uncertain about the southern connection um, and the quality of the pipe there. And it turns out that it still was not in good enough condition to not leak. We haven't done, and so I'm going to go to this photo. I got a lot going on in this photo, but this is um, the excavation at that southern point. And so what you're seeing here, this is a trench box. It's about 10 feet or so deep into the ground. It's used to protect the workers who are working inside of the trench. You'll see the large thing with this. So that 10 by 10 feet, 10 feet deep, at least. Um, that's a valve that you see in the middle with a big circle on top of it. It's actually sitting on top of the force main. And for those, if I get my red dot going, so the force main is actually going from the bottom of the picture towards the trop. So for Sari Yink and Ray, I wish I had a pointer and a PowerPoint. Yeah, so anyways, the, the pipe's flowing this direction. Um, and so this is a valve that's sitting on top of the pipe, but you can see in the background here that that's wastewater that's um, coming up into the bottom of the box. We're not exactly sure at this point what's leaking. We're, we want to get additional bypass installed before we do any ex more excavation for fear that we're going to cause more harm than we would good at this point with this pipe. You'll also see that these two snaky looking pipes, we immediately set up a bypass pump connection. And so those are the um, suction hoses for those bypass pumps. You can also see one of the things we did right on, that's a sight gauge or you know basically a big measuring stick. So we were able to monitor the flow in this pit. What we found is under the current flow conditions that we're maintaining the level. Um, so it's, it's it's not rising, we never had an overflow, um, wastewater never left the excavation. We're, we're pumping um, when we need to, to gravity sewers um, that are outside of the, the Rogerson Drive service area. We've also been in communication about our situation with the Division of Environmental Quality, so they're very aware of what our current status is um, with this repair. All right, moving on. So this is, so the picture on the left, this right here is that hole that we were just looking down into. So this is Rogerson Drive, that plastic temporary bypass pump Ooh, is over there on the other side of the pit or that bypass pipe. This is one of the pumps. So those hoses that extended down, right, come out of that pump and go down into the hole. And then this is the discharge pipe. And we've done a couple different versions. Initially, we had a short discharge of this through the woods to the Oaks condos. That gravity sewer had limited capacity. So one of the things we've done is ex ex um, actually taken this pipe and here it is running down. I think that's Raleigh Road. I'm going to look to Jesse. Um, we're actually 
and this is pretty impressive being able to do this and again not impact traffic and the community along Raleigh Road. Then we were able to run this pipe down Raleigh Road, under through some storm drains, across to Finley Golf Course Road. So if you know where UNC's imaging building is, to a gravity sewer that's across Finley Golf Course Road um, to get additional. So we can get about one and a half million gallons if we needed it, we certainly are not pumping anything like that. We, we don't have to run these pumps very often. But should we need to under a high flow event, um, we can pump to this gravity sewer on the other side of Raleigh Road. So we're very fortunate that we've been able to get this pump, pump in place. During rain events, we do man this 24-7. So this past, was it this last weekend? Time is running together on all this. This past weekend, um, during rain events, we actually staffed this 24-7, but we've also installed a float system. Um, so if the water in the pit did rise, a float is activated, it actually calls. We have a series of four or five different telephone numbers. One's probably Jesse, I don't know, um, as well as our inspector. Um, so it'll call us on the phone, we send out our um, emergency maintenance folks, we can run pumps. Um, so protecting against overflows. All right, back to our map. So what are we doing now? So I put a black circle on here of the area that we generally think is leaking. But at this point, we're also pretty certain that the red pipe, where it crosses Raleigh Road, and then runs along, if you're familiar with the East 54 and a loft hotel, and there's a, a bike pedestrian path along in there. We don't have great, this all was installed um, about at the same time. Um, so we need to plan ahead, if it's not something that's just right here, to basically replace this 700 feet of pipe that crosses under Raleigh Road and runs parallel to Raleigh Road till it gets to, in 2018, we actually did some rehab work on this part of the force main and we had an elaborate bypass set up at that time as well. So we're connecting back into good, um, we used a cured in place liner for that section of the pipe in 2018. And so what I'm showing the dashed orange line in the senior agenda pack is what we're gonna call temporary bypass phase two. And Obviously, the challenge with that is, how do we cross Raleigh Road without disrupting traffic? And so now, thanks to Vishnu, who put this little graphic together for me. So now we're zooming in. All right, we got Rogerson Drive up here. There's the temporary bypass. This is the blue is the pipe we replaced. The red is the light in question. Again, this is the East 54. Um, so the Rogerson Drive pump station in many different versions has been in the same spot and there have been a variety of force mains that have run down Rogerson Drive over Owasa's history. So the line that was installed in the 90s replaced other pipes that were there. Well, it turns out that, let's see what we got. Yep, there's a 16 inch pipe, so it's smaller. It doesn't carry the full capacity we would need under a rain event, but it would carry average day flow for us. Um, so what we've been working on is using that old pipe that crosses under Raleigh Road as part of our phase two bypass. So that allows us to get under, you know, at that point it's seven lanes of traffic. And then we're gonna run above ground again with the big black HDPE pipe to a connection point that Simon Lobdell, our utilities engineer, when he finished up his job in 2018, very wisely put us a connection point there because we knew in the future we had plans to parallel this line. So we're gonna have an above ground um, pipe connecting from the underground to the above ground. And this is what I'm gonna call phase one of our bypass. Again, this doesn't carry a full wet weather flow for us. We're gonna, um, but we need this in so we can start investigating the condition of the red line, the existing pipe. But we're also, at the same time as we're installing this bypass, we're working on a second, um, what we'll call a full flow bypass that would let us then take the red line out in, 
out of service in the future to uh, um, fix. But again, we have the challenge of to do this, we've got to get under Raleigh Road. So in parallel, we're working on a plan to bore under the six lanes of Raleigh Road at Oakwood. Um, and this would be an asset that we would install that actually would be permanent. Um, we know that we need a parallel redundant force main between the wastewater treatment plant and Rogerson Drive. So this would be the path for that future second parallel force main um, to run. And then we'll, and that's our second one. I hope that was not too difficult to understand. That? Yep. That's again, a, above ground, full capacity. Um, yeah, so we'll basically be taking the northern route, which would give us that full flow capacity during rain events, which then allows us to work on, on the line that's going to be out of service. Yep, thank you for that. And so just a little, a couple quick photos of, of bypass part one. The photo on the left um, is that 16 inch, so that's in Rogerson Drive. Um, the gentleman that's standing there, his back is to Raleigh Road. You can see where, so we're bringing that 16 inch up out of the ground and we're tying it. So this is, you know, part of that bypass we used in phase the first part. So we're going to tie that together. The wastewater is going to go underground, cross Raleigh Road. And so on the right hand photo, and it's a bit dark, so that's um, East 54. And running all along here is that again, second above ground bypass. Fortunately, um, the only thing we're really disrupting is the bike path and we're going to and I'll have a photo of it later, but we do have a pedestrian bike path. Um, we do have an alternate route, but all of these businesses, um, their main entrances are on the internal side. Um, so other than windows, um, we're not um, blocking uh, access to uh, customers of those businesses. Okay, next photo. So this is where we're proposing. So we're doing, we have multiple things going on, right? So we've got this parallel pipe that we're in the process of installing. But to do, the, and so this is Oakwood Drive, so this is the, the next road over. This is where we're looking to put that bore pit to cross Raleigh Road. Um, so we're, we have a parallel effort, so we have folks working on the bypass. We also have folks working on, you know, seeing if this bore pit is going to work. Because what we end up doing is, so we dig a big pit here in Oakwood. Um, and this is going to be many, many feet deep, and we're learning more and more information um, day by day about how difficult and challenging this is going to be. We dig down and basically we tunnel underneath Raleigh Road to get back over. So here's the East 54 development, right? So we're going to tunnel all the way across. And that is part of the reason why this, this is easily going to be two to three plus month um, construction project. And again, this is all work that ultimately would have had to have been done anyway because we have to have this parallel pipe in place. We have to cross Raleigh Road. We can't get from the Rogerson Drive pump station to the wastewater treatment plant any other practical way. All righty, um, a little bit about community impact and outreach. So, you know, we're continuing with um, our constant contact notifications, providing um, door hangers to customers, updating our website, sending out notices, personal communications with both, because now our, our area has gotten significantly larger, right? When we were here talking to you two weeks ago, we were talking about the residents along Rogers Road and we had the uh, on-site meeting. Now we're talking about residents in Oakwood. We're talking about the tenants and owners of East 54, as well as Aloft Hotels. Um, and so Simon Lobdell and Linda Lowe have been working on the community engagement plan for the project. Uh, we've been working really hard to minimize disruption, um, both to traffic. Um, so at this point, you know, traffic continues to flow freely 
for the most part, along Raleigh Road, we have occasional lane closures. Making sure we have access to all the businesses um, so we don't uh, disrupt their business. Um, the sidewalks, although we do have, so in this picture, the red line is where we do have that um, uh, pedestrian and si sidewalk and bike closure. We do have an alternate route. Um, so you come down Finley Golf Course Road, just a FYI. So this is when I was talking about the bypass pumping, it's coming over here. Um, but there is a, an alternate route for both bikes and pedestrians, um, as well as maintaining services. So we know, you know, Currently, Rogerson Drive is closed at the Raleigh Road um, interchange. At some point with the bore, Oakwood is also going to be closed. Um, they still have access um, up and out. Um, emergency services uh, can still access um, working on things like crash collection, making sure that that's taken care of, mail deliveries, um, and those kinds of things. We've also been working really closely with uh, the town of Chapel Hill Emergency Services to make sure that they're aware and reviewing all that we're doing as we move on, as well as uh, NCDOT. They're the right-of-way owner. All right, I'm almost done. A little bit about the repair expenses. Um, so obviously, this pair was repair was you know beyond the abilities and resources that Owasa has in-house to fix. Um, and that's why we, you know, con um, are working with Moffitt Pipe uh, to do the fix. Um, typically, when we do a CIP project, we have a, very, uh, a bidding process that we follow under state statutes. The statutes do have an exemption for emergency conditions um, um, to protect public health, safety, people, and property. And so that's what we're doing this work under. A little bit about... Um, the cost of the project and, and how, you know, if, if it wasn't bid, how do we know that it's a fair and reasonable price? Um, as Todd said, um, we've worked with Poff, with Moffitt. They've been a partner with us for, for many, many years. We're very familiar with working on it with them. This is basically going to be a time and materials type contract. We have uh, McKimmon Creed is our uh, consultant, consulting engineer who is doing site um, being our site representative, so they're keeping track of all the equipment and the work, and you know, and we'll be they'll be reviewing the invoices received for the work. And a little bit to um, Rashir's point earlier, a lot of these costs are going to hit our FY19 budget, and you'll recall, I think we were about six million dollars under for FY19, the current cap projection of capital spending. So we're going to figure in this repair. One of the tasks that Vishnu is also working on, you know, from the last board meeting is, you know, the FY 20 to 24, we're still short staffed in the engineering department for capital project managers. You know, what does adding this project do to those other projects? So at the uh, May 23rd board meeting, you know, that budget information, the, cap the CIP will all take this into account and really have a very realistic look of what we think we can accomplish in FY20 as well, or how this project um, impacts the other CIPs. All right, my last slide. All right, so I mentioned we're developing a community engagement plan for the duration of the work. Again, three months is not um, out of reason, and we learn more every day about um, the challenges of getting this bore pit in. So, you know, we'll continue to update the board as we learn. We're phasing construction, um, putting by, you know, belts and suspenders in to minimize the likelihood of additional overflows. But during high rain events, we still are under some risk of an overflow. Again, we're designing temporary bypass to minimize the impact on business residences, right? So, you know, being able to go under Raleigh Road and not block it Raleigh Road is just is key to this project. A lot of what we're doing is part of the, the permanent parallel horse main that is needed. Um, and as I mentioned last time, we do have a request for qualifications out to engineers to come in and do an evaluation of the entire system from the pump station to the treatment plant um, to provide recommendations for additional um, resiliency condition assessment. 
So when this project's done, you know, we talked about the original 520 feet, doing another 700 feet. We did 850 feet in 2018. That's a total of 2,000 out of 11,000 feet of this force main. Um, and again, different pipe materials were used in different phases, so we don't think that the all 11,000 feet are in this condition, but we have to do condition assessment on the entire pipe. Um, that is something that we know and need to get that going now to avoid any future emergencies like this. And that's my last slide. And I know Vishnu and Todd and Jesse and Stephen are all here to help me answer any questions. And I just want to say from Todd's original introduction of Jesse, Awasa could not have done any better in hiring a new distribution collection system manager. He's amazing. Um, he's only been here a week and it's incredible. It's like he's been here five years. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that would wish to make a comment? Okay, board member comments and questions. Um, John Morris and then Jody. Uh, Mary, do I understand this right? Um, you're tunneling under at Oakwood Drive, and so you're going to have a temporary bypass there, and which would be parallel with your other temporary bypass that goes from Rogerson. So both both of those dotted yellow lines would be going at one time. And then once you get the new pipe under from Rogerson, that'll carry the full amount, right? And your uh, the the Oakwood connection won't function for a while until you construct this parallel line. We still have details to work out. We, there are still some conversations about, can we make that permanent? We're, we're still, we're not quite to the point where we've had to make the final decision on what that's all gonna look like. Um, but right now we are showing it as temporary. What would happen is in the future, a, a new pipe would extend all the way up Oakwood to Cleveland and where it ties back in. And yeah, then we would also need to to the south to do the parallel line, um, probably going over to Hamilton um, but, with that. But that's yes. on a future project, that not scheduled right now. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, hi, Mary. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was curious. Um, I didn't understand that that existing 16-inch pipe. Yep. Will that be replaced at some point with a full size? It pipe? will. The 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 line to the left. Will, will be its replacement. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. Right. And um, we are very fortunate that that pipe, under current standards, when we abandon a pipe, we actually fill them with concrete. Back in the 90s, we didn't do that, and we are so fortunate that we did not do that. <laughs> so uh, another question I had was um, about inspecting. When you have redundancy, will mm -hmm. you have a plan in place for, for inspecting the pipe that is not in use. Yes. One of the things we're going to do, so as soon as we get the 16 inch pipe, so this once we get this pipe in service, that that valve that I showed you down in the hole, we're going to, to the best of our ability, try to put a camera in that to dewater it. So we're going to try to see what we can expect. But one of the problems with inspecting pressure pipes versus a gravity pipe is, is they bend and they go down and they have fittings and it's very difficult to get inspection equipment through those twists and turns. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna, we're gonna tr and try to inspect here. I, um, can you and, show that again? Oops, sorry. Over, so we're gonna try to get the camera in to inspect in this point. So Are we gonna inspect on the other side? And we're, so we're also gonna, oh, that's right. We have the point access point. We're also gonna try to run the camera from this direction. So to try to get a, an idea of the condition of this pipe, as well as the condition now, from that direction. Now, if that pipe needed to be replaced, would you also have to bore under? So it's bore? already in what we call a casing pipe. So when we do a when we do a crossing like this, um, many DOT roads, there's actually a pipe within a pipe, and the reason is so that you can pull the old pipe out and put mm -hmm. a new pipe in. Um, so we won't, we may have to extend that casing depending on how the road widening was done, but we already have that casing pipe in. Okay. Yes. So really the, the 
difference between the blue yep. uh, and the red is um, is actual difference in the pipe. So that that was a project. The that, blue is what we just finished up on April 29th, right? April 30th. And and uh, but but you replaced the entire previous work. So that was a different pipe. What is now blue was different. It was from a different what pipe. Yes, red. it okay. was a, a ductile iron pipe, and we oh. put in a plastic pipe. Yes. And and I I have one last question, and it's um, it's possibly very naive, but in, in hydraulics, making a, a 90 degree or more mm -hmm. than 90 degree turn is... Yep. Yeah, so how do not, you do that? Not desirable. So there are actually fittings. A 90 degree bend is pretty, but you can get a 90, you can get a 45. There are different uh, standards, um, but yeah, you can do a 90. So for illustration, we show a 90. We might not do a 90 in, in, real, in real life. Uh, the only other question I had was um, in that valve box where you have the leak, um, how do you know how much is like just groundwater intrusion versus sewage water? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that so we can collect a, a sample and the wastewater folks, knowing what the um, parameters of wastewater are, yeah, so they actually look at the concentration and then they can scale it of how much is groundwater and how much is wastewater. And so it's like all this water? Is, this is pretty much wastewater, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I was like, it didn't look that bad. <laughs> so I was Our wastewater looks really good. Yeah. <laughs> Might not smell that good, but it looks good. Um, Ray and then Bruce. So just a, some comments. Uh, in uh, your first picture, I believe, uh, of Rogerson Drive, it showed uh, a mess. And uh, I, there are four or five residents that are impacted significantly. And I guess yep. that's a driveway off to the left. Yes. Uh, I just hope that uh, that you have treated those residents. We have. Uh, the, the first two well, homes are actually vacant. And number one, Rogerson Drive showed up with their moving truck to move in today. And... Simon has personally been communicating with them and working with them. Um, yes. And maintain access for emergency vehicles and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yep. We've maintained access the entire time. And Moffitt is excellent at making sure emergency vehicles can can get to all the, the And are notified that mm -hmm. when there are road closings and such as that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The pedestrian detour you showed is a circuitous route. It Pedestrians is. tend to find shortcuts. Yeah. Are any of the shortcuts going to be uh, hazardous? or? I think if somebody wanted to take a shortcut, they're going to walk through the middle of the East just before development, which the shop owners probably would prefer anyway. But yeah, I think <laughs> rather than... Probably not a lot of I track. don't think they're going to want to come this way, but I, I do think they will come through. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> through the, the middle of the uh, the shop area. Okay. Okay. And I think we had a similar bypass when we did the work in 2018. We also had to do a, a bypass of that walkway as well. Okay. So you're not sure that you're 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 not positive yet that you're going to go down Oakwood for the permanent parallel pipe. I mean, it seems like if, to me that if if that's where the bore pit ends up and it's highly likely that it is then that's going to be the that's okay. really going to set the alignment you know one of the things that um the the consultant that we're getting ready to bring on board and we already had in the cip to do what we call the northern um alignment study was really going to look at you know initially you know glen lennox oakwood a larger area but this bore pit's really gonna um set that future alignment, but we are still going to have them take a look at that. And the alignment is in, in this board pit. I mean, just information we found out today, it's it's really going to be a challenge. There are so many utilities and some pretty mm, important utilities um, in the in the right of way already. And some of them are, are fairly deep and we're going to need to be below those. You're just now researching right. that we're researching so, yeah. you know we have people out doing um, vacuum excavations to actually find okay. the location of yeah. those utilities yeah okay. right so we're not just relying on the paint that they paint on the ground yeah 
and you said many, many feet in the ground, but you don't know how many that is. More than 10. <laughs> Maybe 20. And what, okay, well, that, the only <laughs> real question I have is what risk do we have if there's a rain event? And I, the rain events seem to be 500 year storms. Right here lately you know we had rain last weekend and we didn't have any issue don't I, I didn't necessarily see additional flows yeah, we really didn't get enough rain to right be much more than a normal day it has I mean if we have one of the out of creek events those are the ones that that cause us the biggest concern and I don't and I don't have a status update of when we think this second bypass may be in but it's likely going to be into next week before we get that second bypass in Come on, Jesse. Come on up to the mic. Come on up. Yeah. He really is awesome. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, one of the good things that happened on the first phase of this was was placement of the yeah sorry was placement of the uh, the valves in the line stop areas so that we have the ability to open not only the 16 that we're trying to connect right now but also utilize the existing 30 at the same time by strategic valving so we have to say instead of one corridor that's not in the greatest condition we have a smaller 16 that can be used coupled with that to double the, or not double but increase the amount of flow that we can get through the 54 corridor in more than one location so in the event that the pipe that's not in good condition doesn't have to take the blunt of the flow um, and to answer your question about the safety of the pedestrian bypass um, McKim and Creed and the town of Chapel Hill and emergency services looked at five different, four different locations, and this was the safest uh, route that we had that did not ask people to cross 54 multiple times. Okay, okay. Just want to say that uh, just I'm very impressed and and uh, appreciate very much all the efforts. I know this is uh, taking you out of your normal business. This is a this is an emergency. It's very important, and I know you directed a lot of efforts uh, a lot of people uh, a lot of efforts a lot of cost a lot of money uh, rightfully so uh, to get this fixed and uh, just very much appreciate it we should pass that on to all the people who have, who have contributed thank you absolutely yeah and i i want to be clear though we are certainly at an elevated risk i mean there's rain in this weekend's forecast particularly sunday mother's day um, and we're working really hard to have the 16 inch line available by this weekend, but we just don't know if safely and practically that can be done. So, you know, if we do get, you know, a large rain event, you know, um, you know, inch or more over a short period of time, we're, we're not sure what's going to happen. I mean, so again, we have contingencies in place. We can pump some of it to other gravity systems but we could nowhere near handle, um, you know, a full peak wet weather event if there are, um, pro if the 30 inch, you know, fails, has another catastrophic failure. Um, You're using storm drains to transmit some of the sewage. And what happens when they're full of storm water? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, see, so we're, we're using a... I mean, is there going to be flooding because of our pipes in the way of the storm water? I don't flood? anticipate it. Is there going to be... In, I'm sorry. Is there going to be increased uh, or decreased access in that? There's the area that we went across. There's four storm drains that go across there we're, that are 30 inches and larger. And we're we're utilizing a six inch pipe that's in there just using using the corridor so i don't i don't feel like there's a large volume that's being displaced but it's the best corridor to keep traffic flow and and be able to relay the sewage you know to a larger corridor i wish you had uh yeah i want to echo what uh Ray said, I mean, this has got to be a stressful time for you all, and, and uh, we really appreciate that you're, uh, you're being calm and thoughtful about planning and decisions that uh, are being made, because a lot of them will impact our system for 50 or 75 years. Yep. So, um, so downstream from uh, Hamilton whoops, Drive, there's a 
long section of the force main that goes to the wastewater. And you said that um, you'll be doing condition assessment. How do you, and that's just a single line. How do you yep. do con condition assessment? How do you scope that while it's in use or? So there are multiple ways that you can do condition assessments. Um, and actually back in 2013 in four different, four different locations on the southern part of the force main, we actually did condition assessments. So this is a photo. The type we decided to use in 2013, because doing condition assessment on pressurized pipes is very complicated because you have to get something inside the pipe. So when we do it on a gravity sewer, we have these two access points through the manholes and it's it's not under pressure, so you don't, you know, if you open it up, you don't have stuff <coughs> coming out. So this, but the photo here is actually us doing an electromagnetic testing on the Rogers and Drive Force Main. We did it in four different locations. It was Vishnu's project, so um, he can probably provide more information than me. But this is one technology. You actually excavate the pipe, you go down, but you're only doing it at these spots that you're digging. So obviously, we didn't dig in the right spots in 2013, right? Even though we used the best information we had available, we had the pipe profile, we looked at the high spots, we thought we were getting the, the right spots. What we need to be looking at for this next phase is an inline um, inspection technology that gives us the condition of the full pipe. Um, for the piece that is downstream that goes across the golf course, we actually have another section of that 16 inch pipe the old pipe still in service so we can actually divert flow under low flow conditions, um, which may help enable us do, to do that downstream portion of the of the pipe. Yep. And one of the things the consultant that we get on board, you know, they will have expertise in pipe condition assessment and they will guide us through, you know, they'll let us know what the different options are that are available for condition assessment for this particular material of pipe and this diameter of pipe. And then we'll, you know, come up with the, the plan of which one works best for us and gives us the answers that we're looking for. Anyone else? John Young. Well, I also like to thank you for all the team's work here. I'm wondering if anyone has summer vacation plans or are impacted by this because <laughs> it sounds like an ordeal. But. Um, I think I saw in the writing or maybe in your comments today uh -huh. that this leak, uh, we know that it's after the valve and the, the new pipe that we put in. It's not associated with the connection that we just created. It's... Because the reason I'm asking, part of, I'll follow up the rest yeah. of that question is, are we certain that this bypass using the old pipe is actually going to resolve that leak? Yes, because we're not going to use, so not nice. only are we not going to, well, I got to let me back up to a better picture. So here we go. So we're going to, basically the bypass is going to start here and oh, we know you. this is a good connection. And so we're actually going to bypass the brand new pipe we just installed mm. and keep going, right? So this, from here all the way to there is going to be bypassed. So the red and blue are going to be bypassed because we, one of the, where we connected the blue pipe to the red pipe is is definitely one of the uh it's suspect it's yeah. very suspect we yeah. we thought it was at the time but we could not go any farther south without being in raleigh road mm. to do our bypass connection okay um and then i'm curious just ballpark what are the costs of boring under raleigh road I mean, how, how is that you know is that <laughs> Is that like a huge, well? Is that a huge budget item, you know, coming up for us? Easy, it six figures, and it's going to depend how deep it is. It's hard to give. It's hard to give a number. Um, not seven figures, though. Okay. Simon did not give me a seven figure. Yes, yeah, so six, and it's going to okay. depend on how deep we have to go, and if we have to go through rock. If and that's going to be a different. There's. There's a boring, you can bore with a machine or you can some, called, do something called tunneling and that's a manual flavor um, and, and that's what we're going to have to do if it's rock. So it's very dependent on what we end up, you know, and again, we have McKim and Creed on board to help us with the design and setup of this um, bore. We've actually had to bore in Oakwood several years ago. We've replaced the water line, but it was much shallower and a much mm -hmm. easier um, bore. Uh, McKim and Creed and Moffat Pipe have also 
hired a geotech consultant to try to get some more information on the rock to take away some of the risk and questions that we have with in the corridor where we have to go or where it needs to be bored. Um, that'll help out a lot as far as cost so that you know what to expect and you make sure that your attempt is with the correct equipment that a, a failed attempt that would have to be removed and replaced with correct equipment. One of the interesting things about how we're doing this that's outside of a regular bid environment is when a, when a contractor has to bid something, they have to put a lot of risk. They have to cover a lot of risk because there are a lot of unknowns. And this, working hand in hand with the contractor and our consultant through this process actually takes some of that risk that you would have paid for in a bid out of the equation. Mm. Right. Well, also, yeah. It's also time and material. Or is it, will this be under an emergency contract? This, uh, yeah, we're proposing all this will continue so that'll be under time our and materials. That takes away a lot of risk too, I imagine, right? right. So, and, and that was my last question. I, I'm glad you explained about the uh, the time and materials and the fair and reasonable pricing because mm -hmm. I was going to ask about you know sort of what's premium we pay under these emergency conditions relative to uh, 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 you know a, a contract that's bid. But I'm still curious, how does fair and reasonable compare to bid prices? And maybe, Jesse, you're the guy to answer this. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be, yeah. It's one of those things that sounds, it, yeah. I, there, there are, one of the premiums that you pay with the time and material setup is really in your materials, um, how fast you have to get them here, what materials you have, you know, uh, expedited shipping. Um, there are uh, uh, other costs associated with, uh, you know, emergency trucking, moving equipment there, uh, employees working around the clock. You have elevated overtime costs, uh, stuff that go into that, that time and material. But the biggest thing really is subcontractors. For instance, the, the line stop set up for the bypass you know, came from all over the United States in two days, and there's a cost associated with that. I think that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. And I, I'd love to know sort of quantitatively what that means at some point, but I don't know if that's possible to really nail down. Anyone else for sure? Um, this is probably a dumb question, but when, are we sure that the PVC piping, when it comes to that valve box, there's not, because it's different materials, there isn't like some sort of, wasn't due to that construction. You know what I mean? The the with the leak is. We pressure tested all the PVC pipe. What we had to do was there is. You can a little bit on the map. There, there's a little bit of red that extends beyond the orange, right? So, so we put this line stop in. We couldn't put the new pipe all the way up to that line stop because that line stop was on the old pipe. And again, because of the suspect nature of the pipe, we had to stop a little bit short. So where that valve, so that our friend here, the valve, so that's still sitting on the old pipe. Um, so there's just a, so the new plastic pipe was all pressure tested um, to our current standard. We know that the blue pipe is good. It transitions to the old pipe, and then this valve is shortly after that. That's all still suspect. And the so, transition, the but, cup, we, yeah. But, but the transition point, which is, I suppose, this side. Which direction are we looking here, Jess? Anyway, I think it's down at the bottom. Yeah, the transition point from. The transition point from plastic to ductile was inside of a mechanical joint sleeve, and that was in the in the section that was pressure tested. Okay. All right. So that's okay. the, yeah. the okay. transition from the, the lower valve is on a ductile iron pipe section. I so, so the transition was of equal and like size. Okay. Um, it, it that transition connection point is still suspect. That in a thirty foot section from this valve that you see here is suspect. From there to across fifty four to the the other end of the bypass. Right now, I just lost you. The transition point. Okay. Which is, I would think, this. Uh, I'm gonna see your picture. There you go. The red. Yeah. All right. So. This section right here, the but there's there were the X's where the break was, where the orange comes into the red is where the bypass was. 
about 20, about, that it was about 60 foot between the X and the, where the bypass comes in about, say halfway between that, we had to make a connection. Um, that connection, okay. 10 feet, then we put a valve in. From that valve all the way to the, to the upper side of that connection was pressure tested. There's a, about a 30 to 40 foot section that's still suspect. So that pressure test actually includes where the leak, where that valve is? Yes, the, the pressure test goes from valve to valve. Okay, so. No, the, no, the pressure test does not include the valve that's inside the, the square hole that you saw the picture of. That valve, it does not include that valve. Okay. So the, the pressure test is from before that? <laughs> yes. Okay. Where we have another valve that's in the, in the line Okay, so there's another, that's what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. now I got you. Yes. Yes. So this part is all old, like 10 feet this yes. way in as well as... Yes, so all end. the way across 54 to through this section plus another, I'd say, 20, 30 feet. Okay, all right. And then we tied in with new pipe, went from there all the way to the other connection, 20, 30 feet from that connection. All that pipe was pressure test, put in service, and... Um, the leak kind of comes from the downstream side of where we tied in. Okay. And we we have no way of testing that because it's full. Is that what you're saying, Mary? So, and we know it's it's leaking. Yeah. <laughs> because of, because of the 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 liquid that's in the sewer that's in the the pipe, we know that there is there is getting out somewhere on either the 54 side or the from the connection point. Yeah. But that's the what, why we're looking towards the bypass quickly to try to get in there and uh, take the sewer out of that pipe to do an assessment and try to figure out where it's coming from. Okay. Thank you. Anyone? Anyone else? And I'll, I'll just say we'll continue to periodically send updates when there's new and important information. So. So I know initially every 12 hours, you might have gotten an email from me or Todd or Mary, um, but here more recently, it might be several days between. So, you know, you, you might, I know we have an all in meeting early tomorrow morning. So if there's some new information from tonight's presentation, we'll, we'll, we'll email you. And, and again, it, you know, we won't, it won't be a regular basis. It'll be as there's new information, but, um, you know, anytime you have any questions or concerns or suggestions, you know, feel free to contact any of us. And I know we just had this big conversation, but I was like, oh, we still have a resolution here too. So yes, that's <laughs> yeah. right. We, yes. And I know you're following your speaking okay. notes, so you won't forget. <laughs> so the resolution is on um, page 4.6 and 4.7. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it is. Um, Resolution finding emergency circumstances requiring purchase of material and services without formal bidding process. So, I know we discuss. This uh, is well. this is sort of a safety valve. Um, the statute says that the staff may go ahead and uh, contract for services and goods and materials, uh, but it says as soon as possible after that, the board must make a finding one way or the other, but the board should make a finding that uh, that was necessary because of the circumstances. But what we've tried to do here is to uh, uh, build a resolution around the facts that justified the emergency purchase uh, under the exemption to the bidding statute. That's what that's about. And this is about as soon as possibly we could have done it other than with it. We don't have to have a special meeting. So Okay, so a motion made by Bruce Boehm. Second. Second by Ray DeBose. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you. So now we're moving on to our employee merit pay for fiscal year 2020. Stephanie Glasgow. Thank you very much. So in December of 2017, the board approved a resolution updating our pay administration guidelines. Key points include establishing four performance rating categories. Those are exceptional, exceeds expectations, meets expectations, and below expectations. 
the resolution itself established that salary increases would be provided to those top three categories and there would be no increase for those rated below expectations. It was decided to use market based data to establish the um, cost of labor adjustment and the merit increases. Uh, the rates of those. This information is provided in your agenda packet tonight. Um, it was the board's desire to remain competitive in the labor market with our salary ranges, as well as with employees that are meeting expectations to move from the entry point of their pay range to the midpoint in approximately seven to nine years. To accomplish this, the merit increase amounts should be no less than 2.9% um, above the annual cost of labor adjustment. Uh, it is important to note that the, the cost of labor adjustment also moves our pay ranges uh, by the same percentage point. Um, the agenda material tonight includes information on planned compensation increases for area entities as well as information from World at Work. Uh, it was decided that employees that meet expectations would be eligible for one times the board approved merit increase. Uh, those rated at exceeds expectations would be eligible for one and a half times. Um, and those in the exceptional category be eligible for two times the merit increase. The top two categories do have a cap of no more than 40% of the organization and no more than 15% in the very top category of exceeds expectations. Uh, we did provide three options for your review. Uh, of course, other options can be considered. Um, the first option is in keeping with the board approved pay administration guidelines. Options two and option three do not adhere to those guidelines. Essentially, the merit increase for meets expectations um, are less than that 2.9 percentage points um, greater than the COLA adjustment. So option two is, is slightly lower and option three is slightly higher than the budget am budgeted amount for fiscal year 2020. And of course, yesterday and this morning, we received requests for additional information um, from board members and we can certainly provide this information to you. We're asking tonight, do you have other things that you would like to be provided? Uh, we can certainly put this on the agenda for the May 23rd meeting. Um, it is expected that the board would decide on a cost of labor adjustment as well as a merit increase at the June 13th meeting uh, when it approves budgets and rates. And I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Okay. And so I do know um, that we do have some of the new updates at our um, at our stations. Um, are there any members of the public that want to make a comment? Okay, board member comments and questions. I did have one. Um, when I'm when you were talking about not in keeping with the um, with our approved compensation. So when I'm looking at the overall numbers, it still is above the 2.9%. So when I'm saying like for option two, 3.7%, that's for the meets expectation. Mm -hmm. And then option number three, um, which said the same thing, the lowest is the 4.3%. So I'm trying to figure out where those. So there's two pieces to that, the cost of labor as well as the merit pay. And so the merit pay needs to be at least 2.9% above whatever is provided for cost of labor. So the only one that that would affect would be option two. Option one is in keeping with the pay administration guidelines. Option two and option three are not for that very reason. Even with merit pay showing 3%, which is above the 2.9%. And which, the, which one are you looking at? Option three, where it says uh, 3% right. and then the cost of labor is 1.3. So if cost of labor is 1.3, you would need to add at least 2.9% to that to make it in, in um, keeping with the pay administration guidelines. So merit needs to be 2.9% above whatever you're providing for cost of labor. 
Okay, so not 2.9%, but a plus 2.9%. Exactly, 2.9% above whatever would be provided for cost of labor. Yep. It's 3%, but it would need to be 4.3%. It's 4.3, isn't that, that That was one of the comments I had. To me, it looks mm -hmm. like that one perfectly meets our uh, compensation policy, right? You're adding 1.3, that's the cost of labor, and then you're adding three on top of that. Yes. So, so first of all, it's a uh, slight difference. It's 2.9 percentage points, not 2.9%. Uh, that might have been obvious. No, that's okay. So, if looking at number three, well, let's let's take it number one. Cost of labor is um, cost of labor is one percent. The merit pay, according to the guidelines, needs to be two point nine percentage points higher than that. So that's three. Three is higher than two point nine. So you, when you get to four, you've accomplished that. Going to option three, you start with one point three and add two point nine to it. You get more than four point uh, you get more than three hang on a second no so 2.9 plus 1.3 is 4.2 yeah four point hey wait a second yes you're right sorry all right this option Two. It's just option two that does not. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, John and then Robert. Or Bob. Yeah, this is um, a complicated issue. Um, <clears throat> We want to be fair to our employees. Uh, we want to have good uh, compensation and we want to be able to attract and retain good employees. On the other hand, uh, salary costs are the biggest item in our operating budget and that money comes right out of the ratepayers' pockets, you know. So we got to balance those two uh, important issues. And <clears throat> just looking at the proposed uh, salary increases, it's uh, it seems to be higher than the Southern utility average in this world or world of work document and then looking at the what our neighbors are doing and again it's hard to compare exactly because everybody uses a different recipe and different terminology but it appears that we're significantly higher than most of what our neighbors are doing in terms of salary increases so um, but then what really matters basically is not so much this year's increase but how does our total compensation relate to our neighbors? You know, you know, are we competitive with our neighbors so that we can continue to attract, to attract good people? And I don't believe I can answer that question. Bob, you had? Um, my, my question is, um, who, who is the world at work? Who does the world at work salary? I'm, um, data when you say who does yeah. the data who, who compiles that information uh, the world at work is a is an organization strictly about compensation and and other hr things and they do tons of surveys and provide you know data obviously around the world uh, i i personally have never seen that data used um in um in a compensation study and I'm just wondering, um, is that something that uh, consultants in North Carolina use as a, as a source? It came to us from a consultant, um, the consultant that did our paying class study. Okay. That, hey, this is you know one way. Obviously, you need to look at local data, but um, also you know, look at the world at work data. Okay. Um, and they were a big consulting uh, compensation. Yes. They were you know one of the top. In terms of size, so they absolutely.
And so tonight, if you can just, you know, give us any information that you'd like to have and tell us if you'd like to have this in front of you um, at the May 23rd meeting. And like I said, uh, expected to make a decision at that June meeting. So I know we've received information from John and from Rashir. I, I have another question. Um, I don't understand the world at work salary survey data where it gives you COLA, merit, other, and then total. Oh wait, there's a four. I don't know so much four is. Hold on. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, forget it. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> the footnote helps, actually. Are you all set, Rashir? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I appreciate all the data and the, the laying out some options for us. That footnote is really important, I think. I think if you're looking at the fourth footnote, which says, the total increase is not the sum of the different categories because not every organization implements all categories. So I think it's important for us, you know, in the vein of John's, uh, you know, we got to think about our competitiveness with the market and serving our customers well, the low income customers, uh, that we compare to the world of work total. And, and yeah, maybe we want to benchmark the components too, but to me, it's the overall total that is sort of the critical market comparison. Um, and so that's one thing I've requested. The other is that, um, you know, I, I presume, and I think it's safe to presume, unless we learn otherwise, that that data presented by World of Work is sort of their, their increase for their uh, salary pool, or, you know, their, for their pool of increase, salary increases. And uh, we're comparing that increase in the pool to the increase in pool for our meets expectations employees. And I think it would be more fair to look at our average across our three performance categories and compare the results of averaging all the different increases to that uh, world of work total. Um, I, I mean, I think the tension is what John pointed out and the market competitiveness along with our, hey, we want to move people to the midpoint of the range from the low point to the midpoint in nine years. And we want to uh, reward employees who are doing above expectations. You know, So those are all principles in our policy and it, it's creating some tension here. So um, you know, I, I agree that option three looks just like our policy or um, you know, that's, that's my belief, it does. Uh, it's sort of at the low end of the cost of labor. I actually think option one doesn't meet our current policy because it's setting a cost of labor that's below what we find in world of work. So I, I think that's actually kind of under undercutting it a bit. I would like to propose a fourth option, which is uh, philosophically different than the others, which is to look set cost of labor at 1.3, let's say, as it is in option three, and uh, then talk about an average merit increase of 2.9 percent. That's our 2.9 is a familiar number. That's how we get to the nine years. And so our average total increase is 4.2, but that's an average. So then if you back it out across the different performance levels, you'd get meets expectations merit of 2.3. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and then what it turns out in that scenario, it, it actually comes out looking in total in the range of option two in terms of the budget impact and the total increase of about 4.2%. Um, and now I feel like, hey, it matches up with World of Work reasonably well. We're still on the high end, but sort of it all starts to philosophically make some sense to me. The only deviation is our policy says, you know, I think our policy says we're going to move nine years for someone who is meeting expectations for nine years in a row. And this change would say, well, if you're just meeting expectations for nine years in a row, it's gonna take 11 years. But if you sort of match our average performance, yes, it'll be the nine years. So I think what you're saying, and actually I thought it was seven years, first, first of all, but second of all, 
Yeah, I think it's, yeah. But I think I understand your point. So basically you're saying if an employee, you know, maybe like two out of the seven years does better than meets expectations, then you're more likely getting, you know, close to that average, but it's not seven years in a row of just meeting expectations, then you're actually going to do a little bit longer. I see what you're saying. Okay. And right now, you know, 40% of our employees are exceeds or exceptional. So, no, you should have a couple years above meets expectations. I like that too, as an option to look at, consider. But John, does using your um, your option that means that we would set uh, the meet expectation below two point nine? Right, the meet expectations would be the merit part would be two point three, by my calculation. Yeah, two point three. They get the one point three cost of labor plus two point three. The average yeah, would, would I, get 2.9. I understand your I'm just thinking back to when we set the 2.9. 2 we had a lot of discussion about the number of years that it would take to get, get to the uh, midpoint. And, um, and the 2.9 gets us there in nine years? Seven to nine years. Seven to nine years. And I, I kind of thought that that was the max amount of time you wanted anybody to take to get to the mid. Right, and and I understood that to be our policy, and I, I'm I'm just sort of thinking a little bit yeah, fresh, I, and I'm not actually even suggesting at this point we change the policy, but maybe you will want to deviate a little bit this year. That's what I'm suggesting when we look at that option. In in our current, you know, if option three I think is closest to our policies. And that the average, if we look at the total increase, it's going to be 5.1% if we look across all three categories of performance. And, you know, to me, that's significantly higher than market and local market and world of work. And it's just another thing we have to deal with. John, your analysis assumes 40% of the workforce is at above average and 15% and the policy is actually up to. So realistically, I don't know historically what, what. Last year, actually, I think it was our first year that yeah. we did that. It oh. was. Okay. And I don't think we met those two number. What, do you know what I, the numbers were? I'd have were? to go back and look before I no. said for sure, but I don't think we were right back. Well, of course, we're happy to provide that information for option four, and um, you know, there, it is a guideline, and that, and we followed the guideline in option one. And if you were going to turn some knobs, I think that's a reasonable option four is a reasonable one. One, I think it's important to leave alone since we've just established are the four boxes, and that whatever the merit is, that the exceeds expectations is one point five. And the exceptional is two times. I, I think that's particularly important to leave that in place. Um, so if, if you were going to turn a knob, I, I think that's perhaps the. Mm -hmm. And, and at, at 3.6 for the meets expectations employees, I do think that falls in a range of our local governments, you know, the range of things there. And, and it is a pretty big range that's being considered as high as 6%. And, um, I guess Orange County, it's hard to give a percentage because some of it's just a flat amount above the across the board 2%. So, but, but I do think, you know, for a meets expectations employee, if that adjustment next fiscal year were somewhere between 3.6 and 4%, I think that's a range that keeps us competitive and reasonably balances your fiduciary responsibilities and and responsibilities to employees as well as rate payers. So you know, I think that's in a reasonable range for consideration. Can I add on to that? I, I mean that I, I was trying to protect the uh, you know the, the three cat or four categories yeah. and the you know 1.5 and two times. I thought that was important too. And honestly I feel like the cost of labor is 
you know, if we shortchange that year after year, which is what we did we start falling behind. five years, we fall behind and that, that's sort of borrowing from our future. So I'm not keen on that. And, um, you know, I, I also just caution ourselves when we compare our meets expectations, which is 3.6%. I mean, our exceeds expectation, which is up to 40% of our employees, let's say, that's 4.75 under this option four. 4.75 is, you won't find uh, a lot of our competitors in that range. So I think, you know, it, the combination actually seems to fit our local competition. When we say we have, when we say we have a merit system, it, it's truly a merit system. And, you know, we definitely appreciate the board's willingness to to put that in play, you know, over the last couple of years, it's right. That, and, that's and, the tension so, it creates. Some though, yeah, yes. Um, but it's also something employees can work towards, and and when they earn it, they can they earn it and they get it. I had a question about uh, the market analysis with the other um, cities and utilities. What's do you understand what 3% of market uh, means for the town of Chapel Hill? Generally, market is around the midpoint of your pay range. That's what somebody who, um, the average of somebody who's in that uh, type of profession or that type of job, that's what the market would pay, would be the midpoint. Somebody coming in with not a lot of experience would be paid at entry level. Maybe somebody you know, with a, a ton of experience would be at the higher end of the range. And so, instead of it being 3% of your actual salary, wherever you fall in that pay range, it's 3% of the market, which is, like I said, generally the mid. Okay, now, does that transcribe, um, I guess it could transcribe that somebody could get an increase greater than 3%. Of their salary, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. always found that you had to really understand and interpret Chapel Hills yeah. the way they did it. Okay, thank you. Wait, I don't get that. I'm sorry. Can you explain that one again? So it's 3% of not your actual salary. It's 3% of whatever the market is paying for that position, which when you have a, a minimum and a maximum pay range like at local governments do, it's generally the midpoint. So you're getting 3% of whatever the midpoint is, 3% of whatever market is, not actually 3% of your salary. If you're in the lower end of the pay range, you're getting more than 3%. You're getting, you're in the higher end of the pay range, you may be getting less than 3%. That's interesting. That is crafty. <laughs> and so that's what 1.5% of market adjustment, same thing? Like mm -hmm. adjustment, okay. Wouldn't that be similar to um, what we had talked about prior um, with instead of having a percent, but a specific dollar amount? Is that what they're doing? Like a specific dollar amount to say if this is, if your um, meets expectation budget allocation is one thing and then we divide that, I guess, by number of employees and then each employee who would meet expectations would get a specific dollar amount. Is that what they're doing? I'm not sure I'm no, following. I think the only see. government that's doing just a flat dollar a flat for Maryland dollar is Orange, Orange County. County. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll get trained by the time I leave the board. <laughs> um, it does help the people in the lower part of the salary range to increase more quickly, and it slows down the people over the midpoint. Uh, so it is a little bit, I guess, fairer that way. Which is what we had discussed prior board meetings in prior years was how to make it be more, instead of doing a percent, because we're always increasing the gap. Um, if you're just giving a specific dollar amount, you know, if you meet expectations, this is the dollar amount you get, no matter where you are within the pay, pay bands. I don't think they're similar, but I, 
buy to somebody else and they ain't no more. But that that doesn't keep everybody in the pay plan in market over time. So not for the lower paid employees that wouldn't get them up. No, yeah. a lot of times it keeps people at the same exact point in the in the pay range and never gets them moving through the pay range. That's why we brought information to the board that it was taking about 18 years for somebody to come in at the minimum of the pay range to get to the midpoint was 18 years. And the board felt like that was too long uh, of a time frame. Right, but, but a flat rate could allow lower paid employees to move quicker and higher paid employees would move much slower. So, you know, it would benefit one group of employees, but at the expense and then you'd have compression of, of another. Yeah, and yes, exactly. Would that still have the same effect as the market where it says, you know, percent of the market? Is that still doing the same thing for when we're comparing these numbers? I need to make sure that we're knowing what we're actually comparing. So when you're saying percent of the market, with it being a, a specific dollar amount that they're getting, how is that related to? Market is different for each position. It's yeah, different what, what throughout the pay you know, range. I'm sorry Go to ahead. interrupt, but perhaps what we can do in advance in the next meeting is pick an employee that makes, you know, this much, this much, this much, and then apply that, whatever, because we don't want to speak as experts to their system. Right. I mean, we call, we ask them what they do, and we think we understand, we capture it, but, you know, I, I, we we could try our best to, to get some examples. So if an employee makes $40,000, and, um, you know, so what would that employee's increase? And take an employee that makes $75,000, you know, what does that employee's paycheck look like after they apply what they call merit or what they call cost of labor or cost of living? So, I mean, we could, you know, that might help understand, you know, right. how, how it compares one to another to another. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you my observation as to what the problem with that is. The, that system is this. You've got two employees, exactly the same job. One's been there two years. One's been here 15 years. One's at the low end, one's at the high end. The lower end employee gets a larger increase than the more experienced 15 year veteran. So to me, that's, a, that's an issue. I think this is the first year we've seen where it says percent to market. I don't recall seeing prior years we ever saw a percent to a market. We just saw 3%, whatever the percent was, we just saw that. I can check with them to see how long they've been doing it oh. that way. That was all I had. Anyone else? So we plan to put it on the May 23rd agenda. Everybody in agreement with you? Uh, quick question around the board. Um, I mean, I'm still kind of a proponent of the kind of the Orange County method. Um, is there any appetite for dollar amount versus percent or to, to look at it? No, I don't see any. OK. <laughs> Where's Terry when you need her? So, so we'll add that to the, the May 23rd agenda and the additional information will be um, the option four is, as John Young described and the, the information that John and Richier already requested. And then to the extent we can, we'll try to have some examples um, applying this information on agenda page seven two to, to different salary level employees to see if we can do a better and understandable apples to apples comparison. Did I capture everything that you all discussed and expect then on May 23rd? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay. So now we're moving on to board discussion and guidance on. No, I've done that, I'm sorry. 
potential waste uh, Western Intake Partnership to access Jordan Lake water supply. Uh, Ruth? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Yinka. So good evening. Um, so we're going to talk about this evening. I'm going to give you a quick background on the Western Intake Partnership. Um, there is no need for you all to make a decision this evening, but at some point we do need authorization from the board for Ed to sign a memorandum of agreement should you wish us to um, enter into this Western Intake Partnership. And that authorization can occur at a future evening. However, I love efficiency, so if you all are comfortable, I have no problem with you um, doing a, a motion this evening as well, but we can wait. All right, so just a quick recap on why we want to um, get to our Jordan Lake allocation. Our watersheds are really pretty small. They're each about 30 square miles. Um, between the two, we have just under about um, three and a half billion gallons of storage in those two watersheds. On comparison, you can see Jordan Lake watershed in the map, which is much bigger. It's about 1690 square miles. So when we get rain events, that are sporadic, it's more likely to capture those and it recovers much more quickly from droughts. Um, we can currently um, access our Jordan Lake allocation through our mutual aid agreements. And you can see on the map, the three orange dots at kind of the Wake County, Durham County line, those are the interconnections between Cary and the city of Durham. Um, so carry Apex own the only intake on the lake at this point, and they can then send treated water to the city of Durham. And then the two blue dots on the map along the kind of the Durham County, Orange County line are our interconnections that we have with the city of Durham. And so Durham can then wheel that water from carry Apex to um, our service area. Um, we don't have any guarantee that we could get that water. So if we're in a big regional drought um, and other folks carry needs that water for their own population and treatment capacities are at risk, then um, they would not send that water our way or Durham may need it more badly than we need it. Um, the second way that we could do it, um, that we will, and we'll look at each of these options through the long range water supply plan update. The second way we could do it is we could actually enter into some kind of contract with Cary and Durham um, that would guarantee that capacity. So under that scenario, we'd make some kind of annual payment to Cary to ensure that on an average annual basis, we could get a certain amount of water from them. And then we'd pay Durham for the cost of them to wheel that water to us. Um, the other two options that were through the Western Intake Partnership, which is the purpose of this um, meeting agenda item this evening. And one of those is that we could partner with, and the Western Intake Partners are the Owasa, as well as the City of Durham, Town of Pittsburgh, and Chatham County. Um, and they kind of got together through the Jordan Lake Partnership to look at how could we all access our Jordan Lake allocations most cost effectively um, by working together. Um, so the first option would be to be a full partner on a new regional intake and treatment plant facility on the west side of Jordan Lake. That's going to be high dollar. I'll show you some more um, information on that in a minute. And then the second, we could also do kind of a similar contract um, where we pay an annual fee to the other three partners and get some kind of guaranteed capacity, but we would not be a partner in that plant. And that would likely be a lot lower cost. And again, we'll look at those options as we go through the long range water supply plan update. So to date, I wanna give a shout out to the city of Durham. They have funded some work that's been completed for the partnership um, through the Jordan Lake partner, through the Jordan Lake partnership. Um, the first one was a Western intake feasibility study in which they paid Hazen and Sawyer to look at three different um, options to access our allocations. And all of those involved treatment facilities. Um, and the most cost effective one was to put one intake and one plant on the western side of Jordan Lake that would then deliver finished water to each of those service areas. Um, and Owasa's capital cost, and these costs are all in 2014 dollars, uh, is with 15 million in an original plant, which we were saying we'd want 2 million gallons per day. And then to get an expanded plant later on that we, we could access our entire um, Jordan Lake allocation was going to be an additional 9.6 million in capital costs. That does not include the operation costs. 
And Hazen and Sawyer also thought that it would take about eight years to permit design and construct. Uh, the second study that um, Durham funded was completed by Raftelis just this past year. And they were looking at what kind of revenue requirements and financing and what was the timing of when the plant would be needed. Um, things like town of Pittsburgh and Chatham County are more at most risk in terms of needing that water the soonest. Um, but they also have some of the highest costs given that they have relatively small populations right now. So how could we time that? So that was something that Ra Raftelis um, did for. So um, the partners have agreed that moving forward that we should all cost share in any work that is done in the future. And so in your packet, there is a draft memorandum of agreement for um, a Western Intake Partnership and it lays out the cost sharing arrangement. And that cost sharing is based on how much each of our allocations to that round four process is from Jordan Lake. So it's based on that percentage. And on any given study, each member can opt in or out of a study. If you do opt out and later on you wanna get back in, you do have to pay that cost along with some interest and it lays that out. So the memorandum of agreement does not actually obligate us to any kind of funding or any action um, regarding accessing our Jordan Lake allocation, but it just kind of keeps us in the game as we go through the long range water supply plan update process. Um, there's also a draft resolution in there. Um, and I did want to point out that um, before staff signed anything that would require money, we would also bring those projects back to the board to make sure that you all supported those projects before we put any funding to those to them. So the staff recommendation is that we continue participating with the partners through this MOA. Um, two of our options to access our Jordan Lake allocation would be through that new Jordan Lake intake and plant. We feel like we'd like to be at the table um, potentially for some of those studies. And again, this does not bind us to anything. So again, this evening, if you have any feedback or questions on it, and then again, you don't need to make any decisions this meeting this evening, um, um, but eventually we do need a, a decision from you all. And I would say we'd want that decision within the next couple of months. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that will wish to make a comment? Okay, board member comments and feedback. Uh, John Morris. Ruth, uh, I think you said that you thought Chatham County and Pittsburgh had the most urgent need. Mm -hmm. How, how do you rate uh, the urgency for Durham? Higher than Owasso, less than Chatham so, and Pittsburgh. It'd be, it, it would be wonderful if they were pretty urgent because they would have a lot more resources to contribute, but I guess that'll be clarified as... It, I doubt any study would be going forward without Durham's mm -hmm. money on the table. Mm -hmm. And well, they've already funded those mm -hmm. two studies on sure. their own, so... I think that says pretty a lot toward kind of their intention here. Well, you know, uh, thanks to farsighted action by WASA in the past in purchasing this tract of land that could be the location for a water treatment plant, which is uh, adjacent to probably the only place that a water intake could be placed on the lake given all the constraints. Uh, do we have a, a, a strategy to extract uh, the benefit out of that the maximum that we can? Uh, you know, that would be a very valuable asset that we can put on the table and we should be compensated for that in some fashion. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the Hazen study did recognize that um, mm -hmm. the other partners would have to reimburse. If the mm -hmm. site was, if the plant was sited on Owasa land, they would have to reimburse mm -hmm. Owasa for that land. That, that could be a way to, um, you know, cover some of our earlier costs you know, but so that we could pay more costs later. We'll have to see how that works out. I just had one more question. How do you think the, uh, if, if this comes about and Owasa is getting water through the Western intake, uh, how, how do you see the water and sewer boundary agreement applying to that? How do I see the water and sewer boundary agreement applying to us getting, I don't think it necessarily has to. Um, we're getting it from our allocation in Jordan Lake. We would be 
Yeah, I don't think it would have. Actually, Bob, yeah, if we did it through a an agreement. It's not a trick question. It is an important question. And it arises out of, uh, I know John's familiarity with the parts of the service area boundary agreement that talk about water transfers. Uh, there was an effort at the time of the drafting of the uh, service area boundary agreement to um, prevent any of the parties from acquiring water, water from outside of their um, service areas, except with the consent of the other <laughs> signatories to the agreement. Um, there was a great deal of consternation at the time about whether or not OASA would be bound by that provision to obtain the permission of each of the other signatories before OASA could access its water allocation in the Jordan Reservoir. And I gave my opinion at the time that OASA did not have legal authority to enter into a contract that would, for example, give Chapel Hill or Arbora or the county a veto power mm -hmm. over where OASA might obtain its water. We tried very hard to um, use language in the agreement that um, that could be construed, and in my opinion, must be construed to permit OASA access to its allocation without that access being falling within the definition of a water transfer. In other words, only a transfer if it comes from somebody else, some mm -hmm. other owner. If Owasa is bringing its own water even through another adjacent system, it's not transferring someone else's water into our system and therefore uh, would not fall within, in my judgment, within mm -hmm. the provisions of the document that require the unanimous consent mm -hmm. of Chapel Hill, Carborough, and the county for transfers that take place longer than 120 days, isn't it, Ed? If I remember, it might be 90 anyway. Uh, the idea is if you, you, you may do temporary transfers for 30 days and then you must give notice. And then for the next 30 days um, notice, mm -hmm. you don't go more than 90 days thought it was 120, but, but probably not. I think it's 120, but you have to get 120. Then you have yourself, to get permission yeah. from the other okay. parties to the agreement. So it's an important uh, uh, distinction in the way it was drafted. And of course, that agreement has served all four parties very well. In the meantime, it has uh, preserved the rural character of the county adjacent to the urban areas mm -hmm. and uh, there was a recent celebration out at uh, mm -hmm. Blackwood Park of the, uh, was it the 20th anniversary, Ruth? Good gracious. That was of the that rural yeah. buffer. The rural buffer. <laughs> but this is an, an, an important component of what has protected a rural character around the urban area. So all of it is in, it's important to understand in terms of the historical negotiations that went on and I know John and I look at it John because John and I have had this conversation before mm -hmm. and I'm sure that your question arises in part out of mm -hmm. the same concern that you've expressed that I expressed uh, 20 years ago when we were uh, you know it took five years to draft that agreement so it's not something that was taken lightly at the time. Mm -hmm. Does that well, give you an answer to that? I, I agree with you that if Awasa gets water from its Jordan Lake allocation through the western intake, that that, that the uh, boundary agreement would not intersect with that. Right. Be two ships passing in the night. And I, and I think the same case applies for getting water from our Jordan Lake allocation through Cary and Durham. So anyway, that's my opinion. And we, as our work on the long range water supply plan proceeds, we may need to clarify that more officially. So thank you. It, it, just as a footnote, uh, you know, if it got to the place where war, where Owasa wanted access to its allocation, and 
you were at that point in time where the valve was about to be turned in order to get access, my uh, advice to Awasa would be turn the valve, open the valve, unless there's some um, litigation, if, unless some judge orders Awasa not to open the valve, but in my view, Awasa has the legal right to do that. And so the footnote is that it would be up to some signatory of that agreement to say no, 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 and ask a judge for a restraining order, which I do not think would be allowed. And so that's how we came to the point where we are, and I agree with John's uh, conclusion about it. I'm glad that he agrees with mine. Well, all the numbers? Um, I would just say that um, I think we have to stay um, a member of this game um, or discussion, not a game. I got it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we need to be a member of it, and um, I don't have any problem giving staff, make a motion for the staff to do that if there seems to be enough support or by the rest of the board. Not there yet. Uh, I saw a couple of questions. Um, why is there a water treatment plant at the Western intake? We have our own, and what's the reasoning? Yes, they, they I mean, so this study that Hazen did was limited to kind of those three alternatives. And the three alternatives they looked at was there'd be one new treatment plant. Um, they looked at one where there would be a two treatment plants, one that would serve Chatham, Pittsburgh, and one that would serve Durham, um, Owasa up near the Durham, Farrington Road waste, uh, wastewater treatment plant. They have plenty of land at their wastewater treatment plant site. And then um, the third one was that they would send raw water to each of the entities. Um, and I believe that one was actually the most expensive. I have oh. to go back and look, but it was more expensive than that okay. one regional plant was by was the most cost effective option. Okay. Uh, second question. Um, there's a, a section in here that deals with a declining partner. Uh, and it says that um, the cost then gets allocated as the continuing partners agree, why wouldn't it just be done on a pro rata basis? Why add that complication there? So that's page 8.5, paragraph 4A. Um, good question. I was kind of assuming, I mean, I have read this how many times and didn't read it that way. Okay. <laughs> I was assuming that they would be covering, you know, that assuming that that fourth partner or the declining partner's money was important to it, that you divide it based on that same allocation ratio. Um, okay. I guess I, they could uh, cut scope on that project, though, as well, and it leaves it up to those partners on how the, if you wanted to cut scope rather than well, and even if you cut scope, I mean, it could still be on the pro rata basis, the right. remaining pro rata yeah. basis. It, it could be, but um, depending on how many partners decline, uh, the result in terms of the shared cost might be unacceptable to the remaining partner. And so to say that as many partners as want could decline and you'd still have to go forward with the project, and you've built in a formula for doing that that may or may not be acceptable. Um, I think the point of that is that what the partners want to reserve, the remaining partners want to reserve is the right to make financial calculations based on how many partners are going to stay in. And, and if it's no longer an attractive uh, proposition, then they would have the right to withdraw. But if you had already built in a formula, under which they had to continue, they wouldn't have that. So does that make sense to you? 
Um, I'm, I, I'm sort of guessing, yeah. but that's what I thought at the time. That we and were I, yeah, and I do know, I mean, I've talked to particularly the city of Durham, and I know that they plan to do the same thing that, you know, staff is proposing here, that not only do they take to their council the, the um, MOA to get some, a resolution on that, but then also any project they would also bring back to their city council. Sure. So staff could be supportive, and then council or the board here could say, no, we don't agree with this particular project. Mm -hmm. So I think you do need to leave an out for the other participants. I, yeah, as, as the smallest partner, I actually would prefer that the formula be embedded in the contract. And then it can always be renegotiated if, if desired, as opposed to the other way around. I, I just worry that with I think greater than 50% of the partners, we can be forced into uh, a decision, or or we can ab abstain, but we can we don't have a, a whole lot of leverage here. So something to think about. Um, and likewise, on let's, uh, page eight six, there's the cost sharing percentages, which are defined according to the allocation. Um, does that imply what the cost sharing would be when the actual construction begins? And oh, for construct. Uh, so the no, cost these are kind of preliminary. Um, so, um, I mean, this is the cost sharing for the studies, right? And I guess my my question is, again. Um, are, are those would those percentages be the right ones for us if we move on to the construction because it is sort of a function of your catchment area ratio um, sort of usage and if we're at the higher end of that ratio we'll actually take less of our allocation than the other partners would so maybe we shouldn't be forced to pay Right, and I think that's why this is only those kind of preliminary studies and I think and the governance of it, um, it doesn't go into the right. final design and the construction of the, okay. of the plant. So, so should there be a term in there that says? Because I think all the partners really want it. It was important uh, to everyone that they have on ramps and off ramps for mm -hmm. this thing because everybody's in a state of flux right now. So we're probably the furthest ahead with our long range water supply plan. Um, Durham just kicked theirs off last month. Um, and I know that Pittsburgh and Chatham County are currently working on a water sewer master plan um, for the county that includes some other entities within the county as well. So I think we all kind of have these unknowns on what are our needs going to be and how do they mesh out kind of cost wise. Mm -hmm. okay. And to close the loop on that, so so those are I think are two good questions. So we could have Ruth go back to partners, see what the intent is. Um, you know, the way I read the agreement, it, it says here's our anticipated projects, but there's also language in there that says there may be additional projects. And I, I don't want us to commit to 12.5% of a $50 million plant until we know we need 12.5% of that so we and so you know yeah I being think deliberate agree, but and I make believe, sure yeah. we know what we're signing off on i think it's important I, we, we we have time to do that so for those two points if, if the full board agrees you know, we'll have ruth and bob check with their counterparts to make sure it's understood and that the language is clear that this does not cover you know construction we're not committing those percentages to construction projects and um, and then also the other question you raised about declining party. yeah right yeah. it's yeah so it, it's so does the board agree that that's two reasonable things to check with partners about yeah I, I, in fact I've got questions okay. bingo i think those were some of my issues so i think those are uh, nice ways to handle it i mean i like the agreement because it's as you say it has the on ramps and off ramps incremental commitments so everyone everyone can embrace that 
I think there is a, you know, the Jordan Lake allocation is a solid reference point for cost sharing. You know, and when you're making legal agreements, you're always looking for reference points. So that's a reasonable one. And I think it sort of embodies the partnership spirit. But I was, I was concerned about, you know, our needs are perhaps relatively modest. So I, I'm not sure, you know, yeah, the agreement gives us lots of flexibility to get off the ramp. But if we stay on the ramp, we're essentially endorsing that cost structure. And so I had some hesitation about that. But I think if we can limit it to a certain set of projects or time or whatever and, and sort of make it explicit that we're not necessarily signing up for that same allocation through the end of construction or operation for that matter too, right? right. Um, let's see. Um, the other issue Bruce brought up is about the different design models. I wonder if we understand or if they should be looking at, you know, for us, our, our, again, our need isn't as high. We've got a water treatment plant that's well below capacity. Maybe building a pipe for us is the best solution, but you know, maybe for everyone, the best solution is a water treatment plant. But that might be a better way to look at our uh, our benefits from this. You know, is to uh, you know, it might be cheaper for us to build our pipe than to share in and, and to upgrade our plant than to share in this big new monster plant. I don't know that that's been considered, but that might be. I would say that if we wanted to look at that, it's probably something I can have Hazen look at as part of our long range water supply plan. That's I don't I think um, that's something that we could do through the Western Intake Partnership. Yeah. It would only benefit Owasa. Right. I understand it, but that may be useful. And if that's something that the board wants us to look at, I can have them look at that. Um, I'm or do you want us to do our first cut at alternatives and then if you want to add it later, you can add it later. Uh, I'm happy with that uh, as a first right. cut. I mean, I don't think it needs to be a deep analysis, but just sort of, right. you know, at the highest level, what kind of costs might we be talking about? It might be out of the question from the get-go. Um, and then the last thing is, um, you know, there's the, actually all three of my questions are just related to Bruce's is about declining a project. You know, there's sort of the, okay, the budgeting for it, but what does it mean? What are the implications for the relationships of the parties and the project? Are you allowed to get back in? Do you have full control over getting back in? Or I wasn't clear on that from the agreement. You know what? I don't think it is clear yet. Okay. I've done with that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's kind of the governance piece, if I'm understanding your question properly. There's a, yeah. Which, which. I mean, I, I guess it implies that the declining partner has the right. choice, the right, the right. But if I, you're going to get back in the game, you got to settle up cost. Right, price, which you know. makes sense. I, I, I don't know if that's clearly saying that the declining partner always has the right or, you know, I don't know. Just um, I think it would be in the interest of the partners that stayed in to let another partner get back in because that would be more people to share the cost. Yeah. <clears throat> just, just so I wouldn't anticipate opposition to that. Just one other thought, you know, we don't know how this is going to come out when the planning is done, but Conceivably, the uh, water treatment plant could be built in phases and, ex you know, built a first phase and then expanded. And <clears throat> that might allow options to serve certain customers that have earlier need and other customers that have later needs later. And so that might allow uh, Awasa to uh, buy into a second phase of construction, maybe. Jody? I, um, one concern I have with um, with changing um, our funding, um, somehow uh, reducing it because we're not going to use our full allocation at least right away, is that um, I I wouldn't want to endorse any reduction in our allocation. Yeah, I think that's precious, and um, you know we might even. Um, be selling some of our allocation and 
future years. We yeah, we cannot can't do that. sell. We cannot we sell our allocation. We can give back it back to the, to the state, and we can oh, get reimbursed for our capital part of it. Oh. Well, I mean, um, I mean, it, every year, if we're not using our full allocation, we, we cannot. Can't sell we it. cannot trade it. Everyone has to have their own allocation. Okay. So. Um, but we could have retain our existing allocation, but sign up for less capacity in the partnership. Right. Possibly, so we may yeah. retain our five percent of the water supply pool. But as far as buying into the Western intake, you know, we could decide a lower amount for the next X years. I mean, I think mm -hmm. typically when local governments team together on a plant, it is based on the percent capacity that you have in the plant. So that doesn't have to be based on the allocations. That can be based on something else. Well, I, I guess the one thing I'm confused about then is um, we we share water with Durham on occasion if they mm -hmm. have an emergency need or and and likewise they'll give us water. We can't we can't sort of put it under that. Well, we each have our own allocation right now, so if we're getting yeah. water for each of us is getting water from Cary, we're each yeah. getting it all under our own allocation. Yeah. Right now, no Jordan Lake water is changing hands because neither of us have that straw to Jordan Lake. Yeah. But we can't exchange Jordan water. Well, we could use the Jordan water and then sell sell other water. I'm just thinking long term. Is there any way we could uh, we could benefit from? from no, I mean the rule. The I can't remember if it's in the statute or the rule. I think it's actually in the statute. Um, is clear that you cannot sell your allocation to another entity. Mm -hmm. So, and that was why we got our level one allocation back. We switched ours from a level two to a level one. So, I mean, Cary and Durham are like, you got to get your own allocation if mm -hmm. you're going to get water from Cary and have us mm -hmm. wheel it through Durham. So that's why we converted ours to level okay. one. So we are actually accessing our allocation. And we could use our Jordan Lake water and sell our Cane Creek and water, but I'm not sure we want to do that. Better, better water. Yeah, you do yeah. have the boundary agreement, and of course, water is about the most fungible commodity there can be. It's very difficult to, once it gets into the pipe, separate uh, what is Cane Creek water from what is Jordan Lake water. Well, how how do we how do we trade water with Durham on occasion? I mean, when they they buy water from us and we buy water from them, how is that done through this yeah, foundation? These shame. interconnections here, so we're trading treated water back and forth through those two interconnections. There's a, I'm gonna do, the, I'm gonna, with Ginka and Ray, where is that? Uh -oh. So there's one at I-40, and here's yeah. one at yeah. Highway 54. So we've got two interconnections that we can send water back and forth, treated water back yeah. and forth. That's not part of the boundary. No, and so what we're doing right now is we're we sort of keep books of account. Right. We get yeah. 10 million gallons coming this way. We put them in the book, and if Durham later gets 10 million gallons, mm -hmm. then we it cancels itself out. I don't know of an instance in which one party or the other has actually had to pay for the balance at any um, point in time. Has that happened? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, when we assisted, you know. Well, we didn't sign it either. We cashed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we were assisting Durham for an extended period of of time, um, in the past we've exchanged those orders, but we provided so much to Durham while they were doing maintenance at their two treatment plants, and practically we couldn't take that much in return back. So, in accordance to our mutual aid agreement, they we sent them a bill and they wrote us a check. Seems like to me the we need to focus that the in the next I'm gonna say the near future, but it's a long time before we would need this as a continuous supply. But the value here is is redundancy and to help drought proof our system Correct. with a guaranteed source. And in that case, I think we ought to move forward with this MOU. Okay. One other question: the actual. Con Potential construction of a of a plant. How many years out is this? Um, 20, 30 years. <laughs> it's all um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, Hazen and Sawyer estimated that eight years to you know, kind of permit your preliminary engineering design it constructed. Um, the more people you have involved or the more entities you have involved, um, the longer that could take. I mean, I think their estimate, just based on my prior work, is probably a really good one. When you already know your governance and you've got all these details, like good ones that you all are raising here tonight that have been ironed out for the big kind of picture partnership. Um, right now, I think that if all of us are continually going back to our boards and councils every time we're going to do a project to get it funded, I mean, that's just going to take a lot more time. Um, so realistically, I think it's probably probably 15 years out. I'm just throwing a number out there, but. Yeah, that was actually my question was the whole governance and how is because there's I like how kind of short this memorandum of agreement is and but in terms of how this would actually work in the future for any greater F at, at the next phase, really. I, I don't know if they, I, I totally understand the governance of this partnership. And, and right, that is one of the studies that's listed there. Um, this oh. is just a short term partnership to get to kind of the bigger. How it would operate in the future. And I think that is from staff's perspective, probably the one that we want to be at the table for. Most definitely. Is that discussion? Yeah. Ruth, Bob, do, do you think in a month we could have these answers and have it on the June 13th agenda? Because it'd be nice to do it while the current board is intact. Y'all right. are up to speed on it. And that's not to say we don't trust new board members to make a responsible decision either. But it would be nice if in you know two, three weeks we could address these questions with our partners, get clarification, perhaps propose alternate language if that's necessary and, and if we could target the June 13th board meeting for that. Um, and if we can't make it, we can't make it. But do you think that might be doable? I think we can address the question. Yeah, it definitely uh, address I would the not questions. Uh, want to uh, suggest that it's essential to uh, modify this memorandum substantially because I think this memorandum is uh, of course being passed around to the other local government at this point. If there were some significant change, they, they, there's been quite a lot of work done and Ruth has done most of that work. I, I'd have to up. say Sid Miller did yeah. the, the heavy lifting on writing that. Not to say it, it, it can't uh, be modified, but I, I haven't heard suggestions of things that really need substantial modification. Maybe there are some questions that we need to answer and that I think we can be ready to respond. Or if we didn't change this language, possibly we could have some letters of understanding of how it's interpreted if we think that's necessary. But, but we'll shoot for June 13th then? Yeah. And I, I'm probably going to miss the second meeting in June. So we hope we all uh, miss it, actually. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't made that decision yet, or the board has not made that decision yet. Anything else? Good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so now we're going to go ahead and uh, review our board work session or our board work schedule. And are there any members of the public that would wish to make a comment on our uh, work schedule? Okay. Um, are there any requests by board members or committee or staff? And I know um, prior to our June 13th meeting, um, we have nominations for elections of office for chair, vice chair, and secretaries are to be made. And as a reminder that the board approved on April 11th, a change to the bylaws, that the full board would serve on the nominating committee. And would the board like to make nominations for elections tonight or on May 23rd? Jody? No. 
No, we we're, we're until waiting until um, we get clarification for okay. questions that we ask. Okay. So another way to ask that is, did did we have a motion and is it still pending? There was not a second. No, I, I didn't. Find Okay, yeah, I just think it's good for us I to clarify. Okay. There is no more. All right. And I do have, um, if we wanted to discuss, we have the eligibility. Everyone's eligible. It would just be determining if you don't want to to serve. So no, uh, prior years we wrote a list of. Are we going to make nominations? So. <clears throat> let, let me remind you that uh, the board uh, did. It's on. The, the board did decide at a previous meeting to amend its process formally, instead of continuing to test drive the new process. You've adopted a new process, and the new process says that there will be nominations for offices at one meeting, and then at the next meeting there would be a vote on those nominations. So, uh, one of the things you did was was uh, not nominate and vote on the same night anymore. So, if we don't have the second meeting in June, then uh, we would need to have the election, the first meeting in June, which suggests that either tonight or your second meeting in May, you should be making the nominations. And the nomination process, again, is that the full board is the nominating committee. Uh, so the board will receive nominations from any member of any member who is eligible for an office, including self-nomination. And so that's all laid out in the, uh, at least in what I have under tab nine. I don't know if you have it in your book or not. I think that may be what she just passed out. That's what I just passed okay, out, good. and it has each. Um, That's why it's before you tonight. Yeah, you? all eligible board members. It would be just to decide if there's somebody who chooses not to serve yeah. in any of these roles that their names would be removed. Um, it's just the word I'm looking for. Well, and another way to As say it is, no it, that, is if you would prefer not to be nominated, if you'd let us know not. either when that next week is, I mean, next meeting will be a little late. So tonight, maybe the thing to do would be to say you're not interested in being nominated, and we can go ahead and line that out. And then at your next meeting, we could have a list of those, a revised list mm -hmm. of the people who were interested in eligible, not just those who are eligible. And so would that would that be a suitable way to proceed yes. tonight? Okay. So if you would prefer not to be nominated, uh, that's fine. If you want to wait until the next meeting to say you don't want to be nominated, that's fine. But this would have to be done at the least nomination will have to be stated in order to have the election. Election on the June. And the new officers in place as a July. So we could just let you know by email between now and and then. Yeah, yeah. Or let Andy is the, the formal report to the board, so that would be the appropriate. And I would also like to mention that if you know you're going to be absent, to please do absentee ballots. Yeah. Um. Once a, we know. There is a provision for absentee ballots, and it is a formal procedure, and you have to follow the rule. And so make sure you check with Andy about how to do that. What What is it that will be on the May 23rd agenda, Andy? Or Nomination. And the election would be as we currently have it scheduled on June 13th. Okay. Um, the only thing I have is the June 13th agenda um, discussion item number five, uh, which is 
the update on unregulated compounds and water resources, including perfluorinated substances. I just suggest maybe including discussion on source water protection and treatment technologies, as well as the sampling and analysis that Katie would probably be doing. Um, and if we can consider a discussion on monitoring uh, PFAS and biosolids and reviewing the procedures that are done in the state of Maine for biosolids for PFAS. <laughs> How the blank looks. It, yeah, Todd Taylor. Those? I don't know, there's a lot to put in there. Okay, so what I was thinking for the discussion on June 13th, item five, um, which is the update on unregulated compounds and water resources, including PFAS, basically. Oh, sorry. Can this discussion include source water protection and treatment technologies, as well as the sampling and analysis? Um, and can we monitor, the second part was, can we monitor PFAS and biosolids uh, and the analysis of that PFAS and biosolids um, by, use, by looking at what's being done in Maine? Because currently, basically, I think the answer was we, we, can't, we can't analyze for biosolids and the PFAS and biosolids. But the whole state of Maine is currently doing it. So I just want to see, can we, can we look at what Maine is doing? We can look into it. There's no, there's no approved method for testing wastewater, PFAS and wastewater. And there's um, a lot of um different opinions on how best to do that um maine is a state that's kind of jumped out there and done a lot of radical uh taking a lot of radical actions here recently and um we can look and see what they're doing but again we're we're not going to have the, whatever method they're using there there is no official method for doing it. so what whatever they're doing I don't know what that is. Um, and then as far as looking at source water protection and other th other things, I'd be happy to do that, but probably need a little more direction on what exactly you'd be looking at, looking for us to do beyond what our current practice is as far as source water protection and water treatment plant technology. Yeah, I, I don't think that's something we can have ready them by June 13th. Yeah, I'm not even sure how to answer the, I don't know what we would prepare, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'd like to suggest react to the information we can provide, because um, frankly, we have very little cap capacity, not only expertise, but staff time right now. We're still a lab analyst short, you know, at the water plant and so many of us are tied up in Rogerson Drive and other things. So, I mean, I respect the questions. They're good questions, but I frankly don't think we we'll, can have a quality package, a comprehensive package for June 13th. So, um, so how about, you know, we stay on the path we're on and then, you know, you can respond to the information, the data, and, yeah. and, uh, and perhaps we can get some clear direction there. So again, I don't want to discount the questions you raise are good questions, valid questions, but um, they're also very broad in nature. And again, I don't know that we can. I don't uh, know if we have an effective response at this point. Well, okay, it's fair. Thank you. Uh, Ed, um, item number five on the June 13th um, agenda um has nothing to do with fluoridation of water right correct is there any way that we can better describe that agenda item so we don't have a lot of fluoride people showing well fluoride up? is regulated so um i want to remove the water well i don't yeah uh, why not just remove the including perfluorinated substances just keep it at unregulated compounds okay Thank you. And I know we got maybe a little bit off track there, so if, if you like, 
May 23rd? Yes. We have a question yeah. regarding that? Yeah, those that? Ag agenda pages 9.2 and 9.3, your next meeting in Chapel Town Hall, that's our public hearing on the fiscal year 2020 budget and rates. Uh, also on that agenda, we hope to award, have the board award a construction contract to rehabilitate a couple of the treatment tanks down at the Mason Farm plant. Uh, we've added to the agenda, uh, continued discussion of employee merit pay for next fiscal year, uh, nomination um, for um, board officers for the coming year, and depending on events, we may have another update on Rogerson Drive work. So that may or may not be on the agenda for May 23rd. And uh, does the board have any suggestions or questions about May 23rd? There was one question. I was just concerned. I sent everybody emails this afternoon. I don't know if anybody had a chance to read them, but uh, there's a lot of things in flux that that are regarding the budget and and the rates and. Uh, uh, the it was reported at the last meeting that the uh, there's a shortfall in expenditures on the CIP to the tune of some six million dollars, uh, no small amount of money. And then uh, tonight we approved an amendment to the budget, uh, which transferred a million from the CIP to the to the operating budget. And then uh, we've got these ongoing costs related to Rochester and Drive uh, Force Main. And uh, we don't know how much that's going to cost, but it's going to be a significant amount there. Uh, wondering how this is going to, uh, we're going to have a public hearing on 5%. Is that the right number? How, how do we, how are we assured that that's? Yeah, we, I think the 5% is still, you know, the maximum the board needs to act on for fiscal year 2020. It may mean years beyond that, it's possible it would be higher than what you saw before, um, but but you know just given our ability to execute the CIP on 2020, it's I know Bruce at an earlier meeting talked about if we push something in, something's being pushed out. So um, and you know and Vishnu and Mary the team are going to bring you a revised number on May 23rd, uh, you know based on recent information, but. I think the bottom line is we don't need the board to consider a rate increase for fiscal year 2020 above 5%, but there could be impacts in years further out. Should we consider less than 5%? No. Okay. I, I don't recommend that, but, but again, you'll, of course, you need the benefit of whatever public feedback you get on, on May 23rd and the benefit of the our update of o and m i think it's going to be primarily cip budgets right stephen um that's changed i think the o and m is probably in pretty good shape but but there's definitely changes in the capital improvement program budget which means we will be advertising soon right the yeah pardon me next friday yes Anything else on May 23rd? Um, we already talked about a couple things on June 13th agenda, page 9.4, 9.5. The tentative there, long range water supply plan, final water supply and demand management alternatives. Um, we want to schedule that on July 11th. Um, and we've added to the June 13th agenda the Western Intake Partnership Agreement will bring back to you on June 13th. And we will amend the title there, um, dropping perfluorinated substances there. Did I miss anything that we need to add to June 13th, staff or board? And then regarding um, action items from tonight's meeting, two key things. Um, we'll provide the additional information the board uh, requested regarding employee merit pay for your discussion on May 23rd. And then we'll address the questions raised regarding the Western Intake Partnership Agreement, targeting possible board action at your June 13th meeting. Not 
Great, so that's it. We're meeting adjourned. Good. You have questions. Question? Um, that King Creek Community Engagement Meeting, are we near to scheduling that or what, what sort of the outlook? Yeah, we met on that today and yes, we think we're Linda, anything to add other than the, the plan that you saw and the dates suggested is the schedule we're on. And I know we owe um, John Moore some responses to some questions. So, but yes, our intent is to stick to that schedule. But we don't have a date yet, but we're working that. But targeting June. But yes, we are targeting June. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well,